2018 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you, would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm used to having that kind of a chorus there. <laughs> Uh, Karen, could you please call the roll? Mr. Dupuri? Here. Ms. Hendrickson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Bealey? Here. And Ms. Auglis? Here. Thank you. I'm uh, glad to see we have a full board and a full house here this evening. Um, I'm told we do not have minutes for consideration this, this evening from the May 14th meeting, so we'll look to uh, review those for the next meeting. Um, another housekeeping note, um, items number 11 and 12, M&R Holdings, LLC, uh, Crossroads Plan Development. Um, those uh, items have been tabled at the request of the applicant, so those will be um, heard at a future meeting. Uh, another just quick uh, housekeeping note, obviously we've, we've got uh, a lot of folks here this evening, which is great. We've got, a, I think I can probably guess a couple of items that are of, a, of particular interest. Um, we still, even with the, the item that was tabled, we have a fairly full agenda. Uh, we can't take up any new, agen any new agenda items after 10.30. Um, so we'll just try to keep things moving as efficiently as possible. Uh, and just ask anyone who may be toward the bottom of the agenda to kind of keep that in mind. And, you know, we'll try to, we'll try to cover as much as we possibly can while still, while still being thorough and, and thoughtful. Um, the next item on the agenda, number five, uh, Town of Scarborough requests an advisory opinion for Scarborough Public Safety Facility Assessor's Map U41, Lot 6. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just want to remind the board and public that this proposed building is located just west of here in Town Hall with primary access to Sawyer Road via a new driveway. Uh, another reminder that the, the town voted to construct a new public safety building at the November 2017 referendum. The staff has been involved with the Public Safety Building Committee throughout the design process. And tonight, the Public Safety Building team is here to receive the board's advisory opinion based on the site plan review standards. And just a quick reminder that in accordance with the site plan review ordinance, municipal uses shall be reviewed by the planning board for an advisory opinion, and it does not require formal approval by the board. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, is there someone here from the team to make a presentation? <clears throat> Just so people know, for, for all presenters this evening, we don't have a functioning hand mic, so if you need to swing that around, if you get in front of the easel, um, you can do that. who may have a hard time seeing those, I think Jamel will try to try to keep images up on the screens that are that sort of correspond with us, what we're focusing on up there. I appreciate it. Uh, so thank you very much. My name is Kylie Mason from Sebago Technics. Uh, I'm a landscape architect and leading the site team on the project. Um, so I just thought I'd give you a quick, a, a brief overview of the site, uh, talk a little bit about the status today, and then answer any questions that you might have. So I'm going to swing this around. And then just to give you a quick orientation, um, we're right here currently in the municipal building. Uh, at the bottom of the page is Route 1. Uh, the new building is this, uh, this area in orange proposed. An expansion of this existing lot would go over. Uh, so essentially we'd have a shared parking lot with the front door of the public safety facility and this building. Um, coming down Route 1, um, you would see another parking lot, no access on Route 1 specifically. Um, access would be provided from Durant Drive coming to the back of the lot here. Uh, and this is primarily for staff um, for the public safety building. This is not necessarily open to the public at all times, although the public could park there. 
And then um, subsequent to a public informational meeting, we received some really good feedback. We've since uh, changed this to a one-way emergency <coughs> access only and have pulled that down um, to the very edge of the property line, um, leaving the bulk of the park uh, untouched. We, we have a little bit of a sidewalk reconstruction here uh, and some tree relocation, specifically about four trees will be relocated as part of the effort. Um, and then, let's see, uh, apparatus bay here and here, so the trucks would come in and arrive here, depart this way, coming to Sawyer Road, uh, then heading out to Route 1 um, to respond to any emergencies. Um, I do have elevations, and I'm really sorry, I, I play a really bad architect, um, but luckily there's somebody who can explain it better standing right behind me. Um, so I'll hand it over to him. Um, tonight we have uh, both chiefs, a fairly large contingent of our public safety responders, uh, Tom Perkins from Dirigo Architecture, who is the owner's representative on the project, uh, and Tony Freeman, as you can see, uh, from, the, from the building committee. So I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Kylie. Um, so you can see that the building is, if you're familiar with the site next door, uh, laid out to sort of work with the site as it falls off. The apparatus bays are on the lower level uh, with the public uh, entrances, administrative offices on the upper level, which will be next to Route 1. Um, the facade of the building is designed to complement the other buildings here in the campus, a lot of masonry, uh, some nice appropriately uh, scaled roof pitches with some flat areas um, for uh, over the more utility uh, aspects of the building. Uh, also a training stair tower on the lower level, dual function for both training and for, for egress and use from the building. Um, Did you have anyone else who planned to, to speak? Uh, not right now. We have people who can respond to any individual questions, okay. but in terms of uh, the overall. Okay. Well, thank you for the overview. And before we turn to board discussions and any questions that board members may have, uh, we do have the opportunity for public comment. And uh, just to lay out a few real basic ground rules, I just ask that uh, if you'd like to speak, come on up to the mic. Uh, Provide your name and address. Uh, try to keep your comments, please, to five minutes or less in consideration of everyone else. Um, and, uh, you know, if there are points that have already, general points that have already been made, we just ask that you try not to be too redundant. Uh, that said, we definitely do want to hear from you. Um, uh, another comment is that to the extent there are questions, um, we will pursue those through, through the board um, rather than have the public going back and forth with members of the team. So. Board members will be taking note of the comments and any questions that come up from the public, and uh, we'll make sure that those are added to any questions that, that we have uh, and that those, that those are addressed in the course of our deliberation. So with that, uh, we'll open it up for public comment. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, my name is Alex Weber. I live at 11 Serenity Drive. Uh, Behind Lois is Natural Foods. Uh, this is my first meeting that I've attended uh, for a planning board, so I'm not very familiar with this. But I did attend the info meeting on April 25th. I think that was just mentioned about the feedback that was given. Um, I think some of that feedback was primarily from me about making it a one-way road. And I really want to clarify just right up front that the feedback that I gave was if you gave us no other option in terms of a road. If you're saying that the road has to go through the park, then yes, I would prefer that it be a one-way road. But absolutely for the record, I want to state that everybody at that meeting who wasn't affiliated with the police department or the town or the board uh, spoke out, had, they spoke out for an alternative route on Route 1, and I think I just want to come and clarify that. I think Jamal mentioned also that this got voter approval on the referendum. I have here the sample ballot from that referendum that I voted yes on, by the way. 
And it, all it at says is order authorizing issuance of up to $19.5 million in general obligation bonds of the town of Scarborough to fund costs for a new public safety building. I voted yes. I certainly didn't vote for a road to go through a public park where my, ch my child plays, where I go with my dog, and where it's a public for everyone's use to now in in introduce what I consider to be a, a new element of risk and danger. Um, that being said, I know I have a five minute limit and I wanna try to limit it here, but I, I understand that there's, there are concerns about exiting a Route 1. My biggest concern is that there has not been a formal study that has been conducted to absolutely merit an alternate route through the park. To me, the alternate route right now is through the park. The primary route should be on Route 1. I've, I've heard people say that there's some grading issues, et cetera. Um, I'd like to see a formal study that was done. And if it hasn't been done, or if, uh, then, then let, let's just make sure that we're following this, the correct process here before we take public land that is for the public use and make it for one use. I think at the last info meeting also, some town official says, said, we wanna have a building that we're proud of as a town. For me, I, it's not just being proud of a building. I think it's being proud of the town itself. Being proud of a town that values its public space, its park space for families and children. Um, it's not just about a building and a road. So that being said, my three proposals are one, please conduct a formal study, making sure that it's absolutely necessary to have a road go through the park. Two, put it back to the voters. I think this is a very open legal question about whether you have voter approval. Again, there's no mention of the road on the ballot. I understand there may have been some pictures and, and signage at the polls that day, but voters read, they vote on what they read. And nobody that I've talked to in this town who's voted for this, and this is just obviously anecdotal, but no, everybody's surprised. People can't understand because they didn't know that they, had, they were voting for a road through a park. And the third part is just, uh, I think that this should be a formal review process. I understand that there's an exemption for municipal projects. I think that's open to abuse. Uh, I think that's very risky if you don't have a formal review of town projects. And again, this isn't, I support the project, I support the town, I support the police, I support the fire. But I also want to have a town that I'm proud of and a town that values our public space for, for public use for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jack Fay. I live at 14 Mulberry Lane, the other side of Durant Drive. Uh, the association I represent over there is concerned because the number of vehicles coming out of the school students and school buses can back up on Sawyer Road quite a bit. So if there is an emergency, I don't know how the emergency vehicles are gonna get out to Route 1 by coming down to Sawyer. I heard someone say that, well, they'll go the other way on Sawyer and go back out onto Gorham Road, where there's a stop sign and no way of controlling it. I do know vehicles have the ability to control traffic lights and they, as well as the dispatch function. Why we have to go out onto Sawyer Road, I do not know. I'm looking at the chart up there, and if they turned hard left at the end of the parking lot, they could go right out to Route 1. They have a much better chance of protecting the traffic by controlling the lights at the Town Hall, Municipal Drive, and Sawyer Road and stopping it red in both directions. They'll be able to get out a lot easier now that they're gonna be moved away from Oak Hill. I realize Oak Hill was a major problem because it was a big intersection, but Municipal Drive, and Sawyer are not that big. They can control those lights and stop the traffic so they could get out. The other issue that I mentioned to board, you know, we've got small children over there constantly playing. Soccer, lacrosse, you name it, or just playing. And I empathize with the man who was just up here. Sirens usually are turned on once they clear the apron. Sirens are 110 to 125 decibels. That's an awful lot for young ears to have hit them. I think you might be putting yourself in danger of being sued by a parent. I think that's a ba major issue. The last thing I'll say, 
You're going through wetlands. We have wetlands in the association across the street. We can't touch anything. One guy has a whole section of wetlands in front of his house, and he has a little frog outside that says, welcome to my swamp, because he can't do anything about it. He has to live with it. You're going right through it. I don't know if the DEP has approved this or not. If it has, I'm really surprised. That's basically all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. We appreciate those comments. And at this point, we will turn to board discussion. Um, Rick, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Um, yeah, I understand what the folks are saying. Um, think about that. As far as the architecture goes, I'm just curious because I've been over to the other facility before. And, um, is there any break area for the guys? I know it's kind of kind of silly, but, you know, it looks kind of like, I'm looking like, where would I eat lunch if I was there in the summertime working all day? And I just don't see it. But, um, I know it's kind of, I think, you know, especially the firemen and stuff, they, it'd be nice to have a somewhere, like, a balcony or something on top of this thing, maybe, or something. Yeah, is that exactly. The, uh, there's a deck area uh, outside of the day room for the fire department. Oh, there is? On the roof, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I, I just didn't police, see it from the picture. Police dispatch and admin all have their own respective break rooms um, so that they can have their privacy. Is there anything outside for the police? In the uh, other than some very nice landscaping and walkways? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, this time, I mean, it's pretty preliminary, so that's all I have. I'll just... Thank you. Rachel? Yeah, uh, could you tell me what... Uh, What's the extent of the wetlands that are being impacted? Uh, sure. I believe the total, the current total, is 1,300 square feet. Um, it is actually under DEP review. It just went through uh, interagency review with Army Corps and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We haven't heard back if they had any additional advisories, but um, when we spoke with Jay Clement, he didn't have any anticipated concerns. If the DEP... Um, or one of the other agencies uh, really objects to the design, what's your alternative? Um, I don't have any major concerns that DEP or Army Corps would object uh, to the crossing. Um, before it was submitted to them, we sat down with them to review the crossing, and at that time um, what they wanted was um, evidence of avoid and avoidance and minimization. That statement of avoidance and minimization is actually in your packet. Um, so that was reviewed with them. We added um, a little bit more to that just to uh, clarify the extent of the impact, um, the quality of the wetland itself. Um, if it, for whatever reason, was, um, I guess, denied, which, again, I don't think would be a concern um, for this project, um, I would suppose that we would need to find another alternative to get them to where they need to be. But again, I think I'd, I need to hedge that with I don't see any concern. So most likely if it were denied, what you would be doing is looking at the same route rather than alternatives out of the site? The same route with uh, greater avoidance and minimization most likely. All right, uh, according to uh, what you had said, you think that there are about four trees that are going to be moved. Uh, where are they going to go, and what's your confidence level that they'll actually survive that move? So it, um, I don't think they've been handed out yet. We have a revised, oh, they have. Uh, so there's a revised <coughs> landscape plan that actually shows um, on sheet C4.0 and more specifically on C4.1 in the supplemental packet that you received. The four trees that have been identified to relocate, uh, the best way for me to describe it is on your screen right now. Um, you can see the trees that were impacted, sheet C101 or 101.0. Um, so you can see the four trees that would be impacted. They're directly impacted by the road itself or the grading that is part of the road. 
what we've done is we've proposed those four trees to be relocated, um, but as part of our bid documents, what we've proposed is that uh, in the event that the tree can't be uh, replaced in a, in a safe manner, that it is replaced in kind, I believe with a um, six inch caliper is what we, so transplanted trees guaranteed for one year post planting were replaced with, um, it was a horse chestnut of six inch caliper. And so that is uh, really the best way of guaranteeing that if they don't survive their transplant after the year, that they would then be replaced with a very large caliper tree um, to ensure that they are in, in place. All right, and if you could just explain to me as I'm looking at that same page, sure. um, there's pretty significant vegetation that acts as a barrier along the road where those trees are. Is there additional barrier, are there additional barriers on that road to ensure that uh, there's a strong demarcation of sure. what's safe and what's not, understanding that children don't always sure. uh, listen is, or pay attention? Right. But yeah, and unfortunately it's not in your packet. Um, we do have, um, and I can pass the sheet around um, for you all, uh, but we have created um, between the sidewalk and the road uh, a fairly sizable berm, um, if I were to look at it. Um, uh, it's about uh, grading from 49 to, at its, at its very peak, 54. Um, and we might have to adjust that. It's probably about 53. So about three feet in height. And behind that is a 42-inch guardrail. And then on top of that, that berm is all the planting that you're seeing. So not only is it a, a berm with vegetation on it, but behind is a 42-inch guardrail. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Robin? Um, yeah, I just have a question for staff <clears throat> in, in response to, I guess, the request on our agenda is to provide an advisory opinion, and I'm wondering, um, what do you want our opinion on? So this is through the, uh, as Jamel laid out at the outset, <clears throat> In the site plan review ordinance, mm -hmm. basically any non-residential activity gets reviewed through site plan. And what the standards say, again, as Jamel already noted, was that um, municipal uses and buildings are exempt from site plan review, mm -hmm. but it requires advisory opinion based on the site plan review standards. So okay. um, based on the typical landscaping, lighting, access, okay. stormwater. So basically all the elements of site yeah. plan review? Yeah. Okay. Um, remind us again, this, the, the, how many permits are you getting for this? So as part of this, we'll be getting a site location amendment um, for the entire municipal campus. Uh, that permit holds the um, middle school, the library, Wentworth, um, the high school, this building, the park itself. So we're part of a larger common plan of development is what you're saying? Exactly. Okay, so in and site law, in addition to site law, what other permits are you getting? So we'll, we're filing, or we did file for uh, NRPA. Um, yeah. It's an individual permit. This does have compensation associated with it. So for that 1,300 square foot, um, the cumulative has already taken effect. And in the past, the town has done mitigation um, elsewhere, so preservation and mitigation. Uh, in this case, uh, it is a fee in lieu compensation. Um, that is uh, $4.35 per square foot, so mm -hmm. roughly $5,000. Mm -hmm. And what happens to that fee that gets paid? Where does that go? That goes to DEP directly. So as part of site law, um, you have to comply with uh, typical Chapter 500 stormwater land use right. management rules. What, um, can you just in a nutshell talk about how you're treating the impervious area sure. in this area? So um, I'm going to come around to the board. Mm -hmm. Oops, Daisy. So overall, um, currently there's an existing uh, stormwater area here. Um, there's some outfall for it over here. What we're doing is we're actually um, grabbing a little bit of this that as it grades to the end of the parking lot, we're picking that up and providing additional treatment. That will get collected in a closed loop system here and it is directed to a subsurface sand filter in this area. We have for the road in this area an under drain um, soil filter here. 
Uh, also one here. Um, we're not touching this as it's tied to the greater um, approval and we don't really want to modify this at this time. So Kylie, can you talk about, um, you're pointing to so, uh, the, the access road to Sawyer Road right. for where the underdrain soil filter will right. go. So that is above ground. And I did, did I, sorry, we reviewed a lot of projects, so sure. remind me, is the Cedar Stockade fence, is, is that for this project, or is that? Uh, it's not a Cedar Stockade. What we have is a 42 inch, um, the uh, powder coated aluminum okay. guardrail that's behind the berm. So it will provide protection so that uh, young children won't run out in front of the, the access road. Right, in front of the access road. So where will, so show me the layout of where it'll be access road, under drain soil filter. Um, so it's going to be road. Yep. Fence. Under drain soil filter, landscape buffer. And this buffer right here, you'll see on your landscape plan, is a, is a pretty hardy evergreen. So uh, talk planting. to me about the, the, the um, lateral pathway then from the, the, the shoulder of the roadway to they're going to go past the fence, they're going to go past the under drain soil filter, and then past the landscape buffer. No, so, they would go through the landscape buffer, past the under drain soil filter, and run into the fence. Right, I just did it backwards kind of thing. So oh, the other what, is the, what is that lateral path? I'm, I, I'm just trying to set this up to see how far away children will be playing from this road and that they won't oh, have a immediate access to this path where the emergency vehicles will be going. Do you see what I'm saying? Yep. So from, and I don't have it on the landscape plan, but the best way to do it is from the... Just give me a rough idea. We're talking 10 feet, 20 feet? You're probably over 20 feet. Okay. So, and I, really it's over 20 feet from the back of the sidewalk. So okay. if this is my land, or yep. under green soil filter, from this edge of the sidewalk to here is over 25 feet. Okay. So with the greater area being, okay. you know, within the sidewalk area. Just a quick question. Did you think about moving the sidewalk to the other side of the landscape buffer to just keep pedestrian traffic way away from here? To keep the sidewalk. The sidewalk is inside of the park. Okay. So the way it goes is you have your sidewalk, the landscape buffer between the sidewalk and the road, and the pedestrian guardrail along the, mm -hmm. the roadway itself. So there would be no really discernible reason why somebody would cross from the playing, you know, open green space area across the sidewalk into the landscape. Just go with me here for a minute, okay? Yeah. So so you're saying then, going in the direction that you did, you said natural land, so coming from the playing field, you'll have a natural landscape buffer for about 10 feet. You'll have under drain soil filter for about 10 feet. No. Uh, if you were in this general area, yep. yes, they would have to be heading towards Sawyer Road to impact buffer. What I'm buffer. trying to get at, though, Kylie, right. I want you to understand is, can, is that right now that sidewalk is up against the access road, correct? Correct no. me if I'm wrong. No. Okay. No. Where is it? So if you were to look at yep. C1.0, yep. see where the sidewalk yep. is so, separated from the road. So is this where you underdrain soil filter in? No. This under drain soil filter, so if that area <coughs> is there, is this area right here, the under drain soil filter is over here at the, at the point where Sawyer Road and the access drive intersect. Okay. What I was trying to just get at is if there was a way to cordon off the road yeah. using these multiple barriers, whether it be under drain soil filter, natural landscape buffer, yeah. and a fence. I think we're saying the same thing. Okay, good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that some of the abutters have the last name Mason. Are you related to them? I am. Okay. And, and they're not abutters. They were just public, okay. public interest. Okay. So no conflict of interest. I don't, I'm standing here and they're not, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I guess... I'll leave it there for now as to the um, staff comment, the, the staff memo. Um, I'm going to take a look back through that, I guess, while my, my uh, colleagues take a look and ask questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'll just start by saying that my kids utilize that field quite frequently, so um, concerns along that buffer and sidewalk area are definitely high on my priority list. And, you know, this 
you know, you assume that our emergency responders are responding to an emergency and therefore usually traveling at a decent rate of speed. And that's one area where you just don't ever want to see that unfortunate incident of a small child for whatever reason just getting away from their parents or the field or whatever and just that really bad inopportune moment. So I'm not sure a, you know, the landscaping is one thing, but, you know, the powdered guardrail, I noticed staff had said it should be a pressure treated wood versus the powder coated. I think that's on the chain link around the, the tower apparatus. Okay. So where are is that? <laughs> so that is that what he's referring to here? On the um, guardrail here? All guardrails proposed to the project should be pressure treated wood. That was our original uh, thought, but we did some further research and assessment and saw that most guardrails in town are, are out there are metal. Okay. So, but there's still a proposed height of... No, I think we should be clear. There's vehicular guardrail and mm -hmm. there's pedestrian guardrail. Pedestrian okay. guardrail at 42 inches is, that what you're proposing? is a large fence, right? Okay. That's what, and that's what's being proposed here? Vehicular guardrail, right, okay. is down here. That, right. that makes me feel better. Um, but, you know, I still want to reiterate, reiterate my concerns Absolutely. about making sure that there's a strong buffer there. Uh, along that same vein, um, I'm going to question... Had you considered through the process a Route 1 entry only access point to the set public safety data? And, and I asked that for the sense of, again, getting, steering away heavy um, traffic or rapidly moving traffic away from areas where the schools and the kids are known to be walking, crossing, playing. And I, I'm bringing it up in the sense that. Any traffic going out to Durant Lane, I think, would pose a concern on my end. Why not create a, a kind of a circular movement through the property where you could enter, enter in through one, exit out onto Sawyer, and have that be kind of the flow, um, rather than necessarily possibly having responder traffic go through Durant, then up Municipal Campus to respond somewhere. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if that was discussed at any point, if that was part of that grading issue that I've seen raised a couple times, but an entry only from Route 1. And I also think from a public safety perspective, if I'm traveling on Route 1 and I have an emergency and I'm trying to get to this police department, which I clearly can see about 20 feet away from me from my car, but I don't know how the heck to get in, an entry only wouldn't be a bad idea. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, and... No, I, I just don't know. Was that ever considered? Was it a, a uh, Yes, and I think, um, and I think in your packets, the best way to help with that is there's a very long study that was done um, in 2017 by Context, who is the architect on the project, uh, and, and a greater team um, that identified the circulation pathways and the studies. And then, as part of um, what we gave you in your packet specifically. Uh, was a statement uh, from both of the chiefs about that process and about their um, their observations and their experience, um, you know, on Route One and trying to get out, um, as well as um, I think I was referring to the entry, not exit. And I understood the, yeah. the public safety concern about exiting on Route One. I'm talking about an entryway from Route One to the yeah. municipal building. I, I know it was discussed. I don't. I don't think that. It obviously didn't go anywhere for a reason, and I, I wasn't involved in that one specifically. Do you have, Angela, do you have information on that one? I, I guess I want to know what, I guess, as far as purpose for entry from Route 1 for, I mean, obviously you're talking about emergency vehicles exiting is usually focusing on that, so I guess I'd be curious what, what you're actually asking for about why you need immediate access. Uh, Route 1 to the site. Well, right now, entry into mm -hmm. the public safety building would go right down Municipal Campus onto Durant, where we have a high pedestrian, small children, large children, all in that area. What I was hoping to see avoided was responder vehicles utilizing that pathway to get back to the Municipal Building and instead creating an entryway from Route 1 directly into the Municipal Campus. And that would alleviate some of my concerns about the number of trips going through a highly, you know, congested area in the sense of pedestrians and children. Trying to avoid that to create a kind of a circular movement of your way in and your way out of that building. So you keep utilizing on the Sawyer Road for all of your exits, 
all your in, you know, all your entries into the campus for the emergency responders would be right from room one. I know one of the early conversations, and perhaps the chiefs can chime in, we talked about, um, as this board knows, when we start looking at even right in and right out, we always struggle with that. Once you open up a curb cut, you're inviting traffic in both ways. We've seen it many times where it's a do not enter coming out onto Route 1, and that's just not followed. And so you're kind of opening that up where that is more of a public use, that larger parking lot. So opening up any kind of area like that, I think you're inviting more of that conflict in Route 1, and that was part of the, the conversations about avoiding um, the issues we have. And it's not only Oak Hill, but also at Dunstan. Um, so really, um, that Route 1 access and the safety and efficiency, and also not inviting public to do, which I know it's, it's illegal to take a left out of a lot of places, but it's done daily and we see it. And I know the planning board has struggled with that with many sites. Um, so it was more of that conversation is, is trying to limit that. But nobody's actually looked at a one-way in road there. We did look at it, I think, for patrol officers and looking at that as emergency vehicles coming in for uh, smaller vehicles. Um, but again, it was we had that conversation very early on with um, the building committee. And because site access was, was a very big topic that we spent a lot of time with and really struggled with making sure that we found something when we're going to invest this much um, money into this building, which needs to last for a very long time. It, it, I mean, there was a lot of thought and conversations around that site access by a larger committee. So it was discussed, I guess, is it my was answer. <laughs> okay. Whether or not I like the answer is that. Right. right. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. Um, there is a center turn lane there on Route 1. Is that correct? There is. And that's true. Okay. Um, and then. This might be for the, the chief uh, or his representative. Siren protocols. Um, what, do you have a protocol for the public safety building as to when they can turn on those sirens? Is it your intention to get to Sawyer Road and then turn on sirens? Um, or would you be using sirens immediately from the building to try to get to wherever it is you need to be? Uh, I'd welcome either one of the chiefs to, to add to what I have to say. But we have discussed sirens a lot as far as using this um, access road and the training that would be involved that goes on top of the training that all of the driver operators go through on use of sirens so um, the uh, protocol hasn't been developed yet but we've certainly been thinking about most appropriate times to turn on the audible warnings. I would suspect and correct me if I'm wrong if your intent is to ent exit going towards Sawyer Road that that since it's a one-way drive should largely be clear of traffic in which case you wouldn't necessarily need your sirens through that portion of the fields? Correct. Um, I think that's all I have for right now. I know there's a note in uh, staff comments about the tower, and I'm not sure what it is we're supposed to look at, but it says we should discuss it. So, <laughs> you see any pictures of the tower? But, um, I think to there, about that later. Yeah, I think there is a, a rendering of the tower in your packet. And I think just by way of clarification, obviously we're going to be reviewing another tower here and, uh, and another item or two um, on this agenda. But um, in consultation with uh, the zoning administrator and and um, and our town's attorney, staff really wanted to be sure that. Um, yeah, how, how the telecommunication uh, transmission tower regulations are apply or not to this proposal. Again, it was determined that as a municipal use, it doesn't need to meet the same standards as um, a typical transmission tower would, a private development would. Um, but staff wanted to sort of bring it up for the board's attention so you'd sort of have an opportunity to at least discuss what the proposal is and, and have an understanding of what's out there. Um, but again, recognizing that this is a municipal use and it, ha it, it um, doesn't need to meet all those same uh, thresholds and standards uh, accordingly. And that's spelled out in our zoning ordinance specifically. So. Good to see Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Jay. Roger? <clears throat> um, th well, this is kind of interesting because I 
I recall going to um, a few of these presentations beforehand, and um, <clears throat> I think um, I was aware there was going to be an access road, uh, but everybody was more focused on the building and the need for the building, et cetera, like that. Um, the access road, that's going to be restricted strictly to public safety uh, vehicles, is that correct? Um, uh, will that be a yes, the uh, this piece um, is for, it's one way for emergency use only, but um, this this access road here would be two-way. It's sort of in the context of the municipal um, buildings. It's separated by the wetland here, so and there's quite a great uh, grade transfer between the sidewalk, as we all know. There's that, that wet, swampy area, um, uh, some good vegetation, and then there's quite a bank that would come up to that. So, so for instance, um, in the summer when there's concerts at the, at the park, vehicles could conceivably, you know, just private vehicles could go down to that access road to get to Sawyer Road instead of going down to Ranch? No, this is emergency access only. That's so only, this okay. Is, so right, so from this point, right, from this point on, this is one way for emergency vehicles only. Okay, because I would assume, as far as the public's concerned, if they just wanted to go to a public safety building for whatever reason, mm -hmm. they would go into the municipal parking lot yeah. and access it that way. Correct, up here. They'd have no need to go down the back or anything Correct. like that. Um, when, a, when a, uh, for instance, a fire truck or a police vehicle is, is leaving the facility, do we have any idea how fast they would be going, traveling down? Mm -hmm. I mean, is that, is, do they, I mean, they, I assume they want to get somewhere fast. Again, it goes to the owner, uh, the driver operator training, and you know the speed is, I'm sure, commensurate with the. So there's no, of the response. there's no protocol when they're driving by a playground or something like that that they might go. To. I'm sure every one of the firefighters and policemen and emergency responders there are going to be very cognizant of the presence of the park as they go out. Uh, it's going to be their home, so yeah. it's. it's uh, um. So I, I know I know the um, the committee or whatever it's called that's handling this have made the modifications to accommodate the concerns of some of the abutters and people who have who have concerns about the uh, the park and everything. So I assume that you guys are, are, satis are satisfied with this modification, reducing the size of it, making it a one-way road. Yeah, I think I think it's a great. Um it was a great compromise between public input, you know, and and building committee to make a shift to uh, make every accommodation that they could to pull it down to make it a one way to make it emergency access only. And and access to Route One right at the site is not feasible because of the um, the uh, grade of Route One. Is is that the primary concern? Um, because they'll still be crossing if they go down to Sawyer Road. They're still, still going to be crossing multiple lanes, depending if they're going north or something. Correct. There's a signal at Sawyer Road, but mm -hmm. I think for all the reasons Angela had described, uh, they were discussed, and then um, they looked towards the alternative. I think there's also a, a memo in your packet from the police and fire chief um, talking about specifically that issue um, with, with con great. direct connection on Route yeah. 1 and, and the issues that they saw highlighted um, with their years of experience and um, their knowledge of just the site that they're at now. And then on top of that, having additional issues with that, the specific location where this would come out on Route 1. What, what accommodations of, maybe there's something in here and I just didn't see it, but when, um, when a public safety vehicle is, is leaving the access road approaching Sawyer, what's, what's going to happen once they get to Sawyer? Are there any kind of signals or anything like that? Uh, yeah, we, we right, right at Sawyer itself, not Sawyer and Route 1, but right at Sawyer. Uh, we discussed um, <coughs> having um, that connection so as they're leaving um, the apparatus base, you can have um, warning lights on Sawyer so that you have emergency, mm -hmm. knowing if emergency vehicles are going to be entering, like you said, directly onto Sawyer. And then it would also be connected to the traffic signal light at Sawyer and Route 1 to be, okay. give, give them the green, to clear that out ahead of them yeah. as well before they get there. Um, and to be able to use, utilize that signal. I guess I'm all set. I want to do something for Sue. <laughs> Susan? We always have something. Um, I'm just, for the audience, I don't know 
about you, but the first time I, um, I heard that town buildings do not have to conform in the same way that private development does was a bit of a shock. But I just want to make sure that people know that the committee that came up with this worked very closely with all the departments. And the, the input has been everybody talking with everybody. So it's not like somebody over here just said, this might be a good idea. Now let's just run it by and see where we can go with it. It's been a very, very um, <clears throat> long and um, I won't say arduous, but um, in detail process. I have just a couple of quick questions. Um, I think the entry only off room one, by the way, wouldn't work for several reasons, but one of them is the grading was really Thank you. The grading is really bad there. Nobody wants to hear it anyway. Oh, yeah, right. I want to uh, um, also join in with the SIREN protocol and the SPEED protocol. I have no doubt that the department will take excellent care, but it doesn't hurt to sit here and, and say that that's going to be something that's going to be potentially an issue for people who live nearby. Um, okay. Where the guardrail that is the tall one mm -hmm. as opposed to the short one. Mm -hmm. Okay, the tall one is gonna be wooden? No, the tall one is gonna be powder coated aluminum. Okay, and the shorter one's going to be? The sh shorter one is gonna be uh, Corten steel, or the weathering steel. It's the, <coughs> the vehicular Neither one of them are going to be stockade. Neither one of them are gonna be stockade. I lose that battle all the time. I've never won that battle. Okay, um, this idea on the um, June 4th memo from the advisory opinion review mm -hmm. saying that it might be a good idea to provide temporary walking path during, in Memorial Field during the construction. Is that something that's been considered? And the nodding yes. is good. Yes. Okay. And then um, the coordination between campus signage and town's directory signage. To me, that signage is a very important mm -hmm. item, so let's try it. It says it's going to be right next door. Let's make sure that it's all tied in together. And was this question about the superintendent of the sewer district some concerns about the connection at Sawyer Road? Is this something that we should be? I, it's more of a, a cost analysis and ah. looking at is it cheaper to do a pump rather than gravity? So it's into the details okay. of just what's more cost effective. So our town engineer is working closely yeah. with them. Thank mm -hmm. you. That's, that's good. Um, I'm pleased that this is where it's going. I mean, it's not the ideal location. I thought the best location of all was the land that we, I think we bought it at the corner of um, Route 1 and, not Enterprise, what is it? It goes down towards the um, back end of the... Why don't we put it there? Well, because the veteran's home is right there. And it doesn't make any sense to put sirens coming in the back end of the veteran's home. Short of that piece of property, I think this is this is this is a very good choice. Um, it's going to be a while. I don't think I have any other questions. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Um, as a couple of uh, my fellow board members have said, I mean, this is, you know, it's certainly not an ideal location or configuration, and there are some legitimate concerns. That said. Um, there's not a lot of vacant land in, in Oak Hill, and if you, want a, if you want a new public safety complex, that's sort of part of the municipal complex at Oak Hill. Uh, the, the options are limited, um, and I think that all things considered, the committee and, and the departments have done a good job of uh, coming up with a, a workable solution, workable provided that, um, as has been suggested, and, and I have every confidence um, that the committee and, and the departments going forward will will heed the, the input that's been given um, and that the, that the public safety departments will develop good protocols around speed and siren uh, noise and, and things like that. Uh, buffering will be critical both for visual impact from the park as well as um, safety. Buffering and, and, and fencing as has been discussed um, signage, signaling, especially as it relates to that one-way out uh, road so that people don't find themselves um, wandering into, into trouble there, whether they're driving or on foot, especially kids, as, been, as was discussed. Um, so and again, this, this is, to step back a little bit, this, this is always a little bit uncomfortable for the board when we have these situations where we're asked to give 
an advisory opinion, and I and I you know we chuckled a little bit when when the question came up, what do you want our opinion on? <laughs> but I think in, in, in a sense that's you know that's a very legitimate question with things like this, and we we encounter with municipal uses periodically. We'll have public utilities, CMP will come in with with something, and at the end of the day, we really don't have site plan jurisdiction over those things, um, and we. Um, I, I, I think we've had a good experience overall with, with, uh, with those users heeding our, our input and being sensitive to our concerns and the public's concerns. Um, but, and, and I can understand why some of the public might think it's not really right that we don't have full site plan uh, review over municipal uses, but that's not something that this board really has any control over. We, we enforce the, the ordinance. so. Um, Similarly, the, you know, the comment about what, what people may or may not have thought they voted for, that's really beyond uh, the purview of this, of this board. And again, I think the process that is followed to the extent that I've followed it and, and <coughs> familiar with it has been pretty rigorous and, and pretty transparent. And given the limited options involved and, and the um, impetus of, of needing a new public safety complex, um, I think that Again, all things considered, this is a this is a, a pretty good outcome. Uh, just looking back over my notes and some of the public comment, uh, there's, there was a question about wetlands and envir environmental review. That was that was addressed by the applicant's representative. It's under DEP review. Um, again, we talked about guardrails, fencing, buffering. Um, again, I guess you know the uh, telecom tower sort of is what it is. Uh, but we would just ask that there be uh, care given to things like buffering around the base of it. Obviously, we're not going to put a big monopine <laughs> um, <laughs> as part of the municip municipal complex, and we'll save monopine, monopine discussion for later tonight. Um, but again, I think um, to sum up the board's general feeling on this, um, you know, we have some concerns, and we have some things that we would like to see addressed and make sure uh, everyone remains sensitive to, uh, but generally, Supportive of this with those caveats, and I'm sorry we're we're we do appreciate the, just the public hear, comment. He asked a question, and I didn't hear it. An, anybody answer, Mr. McKee? You said if I'm driving along Route One and I have an emergency in my car, how do I get I'm, into the police and fire department? I'll I'll let Nick speak for himself. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, general feelings, you know. It is what it is. However, I do want to, for the record, express that I do have major concerns about using Durant Drive as an access point for emergency responder vehicles. Um, and I do believe that consideration should be given to uh, Route 1 entry point, not just for emergency responders, but for general public. Um, I do see that being an issue, um, especially since um, if you drive by it, you've got to go down Sawyer and you can't even take the first right you see, you end up down on Durant and circling all the way back around to get to that building if you're just a general member of this public. And if you're not from Scarborough, if you're even if you are from Scarborough, there's a good chance that getting yourself to that station will become a real big issue. And I, I feel that that's a big safety priority for our community to have access to our police and fire and <coughs> types of emergency. So I'd like that noted for my section of the sure. advisory opinion. I should say again, as just thinking about what this advisory opinion means, it's you know it's it's not a vote per se. There's no mandate coming from this board, and so the the opinion is really the collective the collective comments of the board, and this is all on record, and it will all be um, all be taken into consideration. Whether anything ultimately changes or not, we don't know, uh, but I do appreciate the further elaboration on that, Robin. Yeah. I guess um, for full opinion disclosure, I guess I'd like to I'd like to note that um, I, I would like to see the town build a really um, robust communication um, sort of initiative or program around this new public safety building. Meaning, let it, addressing exactly what Nick just said as far as if you need to get from point A to point B, it's signage. It's outreach, it's letting, it's addressing some of these fears that, and, and assuaging, I think, some of the comments that have been here, like, this is how the children in the park will be protected. There's this barrier and that barrier and this barrier and that protocol and this protocol. So I think um, 
it, it would be worth some time, effort, and resources to put into letting the community know these are the practices that are in place to protect the children um, playing here, to protect the environment, and some of the other sort of comments that we've heard here. Thank you. I agree with that, and, and I, think, I think you suggested part of that is just the basics of how does someone from the public mm -hmm. get to the public safety building. Um, so those are definitely good comments, again, and, and I know, and I'm sure others have seen, there, there are plenty of other towns that have public safety complexes as part of the municipal complexes and towns that have more of a true town center than Scarborough has. It can be done. There are definitely considerations that have to be, uh, that have to be factored in, uh, but we're hopeful that, that will, the folks will follow through on that, and I agree that communication and the messaging on that will be important. Is there anyone, anyone else who'd like to add anything? Again, I, I appreciate, we all appreciate the, the public input, and um, we'll look forward to seeing how this unfolds. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your time. Item number six on our agenda, Henrique Barbosa requests an advisory opinion for a miscellaneous appeal for an expansion at 7 North Street, Assessor's Map U31, Lot 39A. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just as a reminder, the applicant has submitted an application for a miscellaneous appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals for the expansion of a non-conforming use of land, which is a 24 by 36 foot uh, garage that is proposed. Uh, as a reminder, single family homes are not a permitted land use in the TBC zoning district, hence the miscellaneous appeal. Uh, prior to the application going in front of the ZBA, the planning board is required to pro provide you know, another advisory opinion for consideration by the ZBA. Uh, Section 3F in the zoning ordinance provides a specific review criteria for this process. It essentially, essentially states that the proposed use will not have a great impact on existing uses in the neighborhood. Uh, staff has reviewed the application, and we don't have any further comments about the project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will welcome the applicant or the representative. Hi, my name is Tim Labby, and um, we're proposing to build a residential garage, and the property that he has, I guess, is in a commercial zoning land. And we don't. We have other people in the area that have garages, and we don't think it'll be on any effect as far as visual appearance from Route One. So we don't know exactly what you would need in addition to for us to get obtain our permit. As far as we don't see anything conflicting with anything around the area. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone on the board have any comments or questions on this? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, you have to go through a lengthy process to get a garage in your property. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Levy, your role in the project is? I'm the general manager of the company. Okay. Um, in on page seven of the application that we have, it says that no sedimentation control will, will be used during construction. That that concerns me. Exactly. What do you mean? Um, any project, large or small. Um, when it comes to construction, yeah. has some degree of erosion and sedimentation that it can potentially run off from a site. And so right. the fact that there's none being used is a concern for me. Okay. Um, if there was something that we needed to do for the town, we could do it. I mean, I, I don't know if you were requiring a silt fence or, or yeah, what you might you're need. On the right, what, yeah, what, like, whatever you guys need, we will comply with. Okay, so maybe I could just ask that you talk with staff to talk about what the best sort of erosion, what the lowest point might be where everything okay. is, is leaving the site and making sure that there's some type of uh, sediment barrier or the like. So okay. yeah, if you no could problem. just talk with staff. No problem. Great. And I think that was it. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I, I'm looking at the plan for the garage and I, I just have a question. It appears as though there's a second floor. Yes. Is that going to be used for anything other than storage? Storage, residential, that's it. It won't be an apartment or nothing like that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? 
Susan? I want to go back to that point just for a second. Um, I'm of, I'm of, the, of a, the bent that we should not be expending a non-conforming use by making it more non-conforming. And I'd like to see it be conforming. However, in this particular case, I'm willing to go along with it as long as it's very clear that that second floor is not to be used for any kind of a living space. I don't know whether we can put that into the, um, what am I trying to say? In, in, into the in, Board of Appeals. Yeah, in the Board of Appeals, when we send it to the Board of Appeals. That we're very concerned that it not be turned as an opportunity to make this non-conforming use even more non-conforming, okay? Yes. Thank as you. Far, as far as our company, it will be strictly residential use. Right. But I mean, what, but see, the thing is, if it goes with what the ZBA says, it goes with the house. Yep. So that if it gets sold, it isn't going to be no longer applicable. It will be applicable as long as that building stands there. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, those are both good, good uh, catches. Um, yeah, I don't have any issues with this. As Ms. Ogla said, we generally like to prevent Do things from becoming your eyes, your <laughs> more non-conforming and, and make sure we're covering covering all the details. So um, we're sending unanimous, unanimously positive uh, opinion to the ZBA uh, with the caveats that um, you'll work with the town staff Absolutely. Uh, if approved to uh, implement a, a sedimentation control plan during construction and that there be no residential use on the upper floor. Absolutely. So. All right. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Good luck. Item number seven, ENF Limited Liability Company requests a sketch plan review for Land Rover Jaguar, 371 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U39, Lot 46A. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this location is, is uh, 371 U.S. Route 1 of the existing Land Rover Jaguar automobile dealership. Uh, it's in the B3 and HP Pygus Parkway zones, and also it is a contract zone. Um, the applicants in front of the board for a sketch plan review for a parking lot expansion project in order to provide additional space for new inventory on the site. Um, just a little background about the contract zone amendment process, since this is located in one. Uh, the town council has held its first reading of the proposed fifth contract zone amendment in April 2018. Uh, subsequent to the sketch plan review, the applicant will need to receive preliminary site plan approval by the board. Uh, subject to the enactment of a contract zone amendment by town council. Um, if and when the contract zone amendment is accepted by the council, the applicant will then return to the planning board for a final site plan approval. Um, some specific elements uh, for the sketch plan tonight. Uh, staff would just like to note that Willowdale Brook, which is located just east of the site, is located on, is on Maine DEP's threatened watershed list. Uh, so consideration of this designation should be considered when designing the project. Uh, the applicant should be aware that they are proposing this expansion project on a lot that was approved within the Enterprise Business Park subdivision. So staff uh, questions if the proposed use of this lot will require any sort of subdivision amendment. So the applicant should be ready to discuss that. Uh, visual buffer along the property boundaries uh, for budding properties will be important for the project. And finally, um, the applicant is encouraged to meet with the town engineer uh, to discuss the proposed stormwater management infrastructure as they're designing their project. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. And I'll turn over to the applicant's team. Do they have anything to add? Yep. Good evening. Uh, Paul Ostrowski from Sebago Technics. And with me is uh, Chris Goodwin, uh, manager for ENF Limited Liability. Uh, we're here basically to, you know, in a sketch can sketch plan capacity to kind of introduce the project to the board, get some feedback from the board as well as town staff. We are adding about 75 parking or 75, 80 parking spaces total. Um, basically, as people drive by Route 1, you can see that they're currently under construction, uh, basically updating the building facade. Um, and as part of the dealership requirements, there is a certain number of parking spaces that they're required to have. Uh, there's deficient in those and providing these additional parking spaces would bring them up at 
<coughs> excuse me, in compliance with those requirements for the dealership. Um, they've entered into a purchase and sales agreement with uh, the owner of the abutting parcel to expand into that area. Um, the feedback we got from town council when we went for the first reading was to, you know, they were going to be really interested to know how that existing zone, any sort of space and bulk requirements were going to play into the current development and also the contract zoning. Um, the, the way that the project was developed was that we were going to be very inside setback lines. We're not exceeding, um, you know, the, the maximum impervious coverage ratio um, for that underlying zone. It, we're just trying to get to a minimum number that they can utilize and safely work through their inventory, work through their um, service vehicles. Um, the, the intent is that area is relatively flat. We're trying to take advantage of that you know, kind of nice flat grading. Um, we're going to be using a under drain soil filter to detain, treat uh, all the runoff that's going to be generated from that uh, expanded parking lot, not touching the existing detention and stormwater management facility uh, that currently exists. Um, and, you know, as we develop further into the uh, project, we'll be definitely con taking into all consideration uh, staff comments for buffering. Uh, circulation, auto turn, uh, no real expanded utilities with the exception of some site lighting, which, you know, as noted, will be full cut off. And we just wanted to kind of get the feedback from staff and board. Thank you. Um, Roger, would you like to start? Uh, I actually don't have. Um, any questions, I don't believe, pertaining to this. This is just a sketch plan at this point. And like you say, you're going to be back with further information. Correct. Um, I, I don't really see any problem with this. Um, okay. I think I'm all set. Thank you. Susan? Um, I would just like to reiterate what, <clears throat> what was said at the very beginning here, that the, the Willowdale Brook is going to be a big deal for us. In consideration of the designation, you know, it has to be taken into account when you're doing your design. Um, and then the, the thing with the Enterprise Business Park subdivision is something that's, you know, pretty straightforward. Either you do or you don't. And um, I would imagine the staff can help them figure that out. Yes? Yep. Okay. Um, you, said, you said something about the, um, the, re the required parking. Is this the town's required parking for the size of the building? Or is it the dealership requirement? No, it's it's through the branding with Land Rover Jaguar. They have a minimum number of parking spaces that they want their facilities to have based on the amount of uh, business they, they produce. <clears throat> um, buffering is going to be very important. I do know enough about what that piece of land is to know that it is that you are lucky that it's going to be so nice and flat, considering what the frontage is on Route 1 is anything but. Um, when this place first opened, when, when Land Rover first opened, um, I personally developed some um, tension between myself and the dealership. <laughs> and I'm sure you pretty much know what I'm going to talk about, but I would just mention that when somebody says they're going to do something, they really need to do it. And parking was a big, big problem. And we finally just ended up, you know, having to go in like twice a week to say you're not doing it according to the... Um, according to what it was we um, okayed. So just to say that we're going to watch carefully, that's all. I think it, I think they're making a big improvement in your building. Um, just to review the, the site plan review check points here, uh, the auto turn simulation and um, snow storage design. Um, <coughs> sometimes that is sort of put in the back burner. <coughs> With something like an automobile dealership, it can be a big deal. So. Yep, no, in, uh, you know, look, looking at the graphic where you can see that kind of the two access points coming off of the existing parking lot, mm -hmm. off to that uh, left-hand side, that was purposely kind of left open. There was, we're getting diminishing return, expanding the parking into that area, and that, that's nice flat area, and it actually does not grade back down. It comes kind of towards the site. And how and is that's, that going to affect the book? I'd show me where, can you, can somebody just show me where is the book on this? 
Jamel's running his... Uh, Jamel's running his... To the right. To the right, as I look at it. Okay, yeah. thank you. That, that answers that question. And again, the visual buffer is important. Um, I like the fact that staff has started using a phrase that I am quite fond of, utilizing buried and layered rows of vegetation, spoken like a real landscaper. And I just love it. An aesthetically pleasing and effective buffer. And again, not to point fingers, but it's all an intention. Okay, it's all in what the intention is. Um, we're not even, we really don't want you here. We don't want automobile dealerships on Route 1 in Scarborough, but we've got them. And I think that it's up to, it's the responsibility of the person who owns this to make sure that it's as attractive as possible. And if you want to know how not to do it, I can tell you some places you could drive by to figure out how not to do it. So I have great hopes, and I look forward to seeing you come back. Thank you. Thank you. Nick? I don't have a whole lot on this. All right. Rick? Um, I think it looks fine for sketch. Okay. Thank you. Rachel? Yeah, I'm, I just need you to outline what property you're actually buying. I'm looking at uh, the plan, and I can't quite tell. Yep, so currently they own this parcel, and it actually extends up. This is rather steep grade, and we don't want to utilize that at all. Basically, the parcel they're acquiring is right here. It's about, uh, I believe, 0.9 acres. So basically, it looks as though you're using 80% of it for parking of what's being acquired. Uh, I, I, it's under 80%. I, I know it's, it's far within the, uh, what's allowed under the HPZ, HPZ zone. And as we develop the site plan, we will be providing additional information because the council was um, very keen on that, on how it compared. I'm just wondering how much more is left to be developed and at what point you come back to us and ask for another 10 or 15 spaces in that area. Is that an option, a possibility? It's a possibility, but um, right now we're, we're looking to gain the 80 so spaces to get to the, I think it's a total of 175. Um, I'm uh, Chris Goodwin, as, as Paul mentioned. I'm um, one of the uh, owners of the dealership. Uh, the additional parking, as he said, is required under the franchise agreement with Jaguar Land Rover. You know, we're a franchise just like all car, car manufacturers are, like McDonald's is, and when they tell us we have to do something, we have to do it. Um, the parking that we have here, I want to be very clear, is a decent bit more than that. Um, that's required really by our operational requirements. We've had the good fortune to have grown quite a lot over the last few years, and as a requirement for the um, storage of new and used inventory for service vehicles, for customer parking, for employee parking, um, we are we have wildly less than we need, and particularly in light of the construction, have had to store a lot of vehicles off-site, which is neither efficient nor safe. Um, having people doing trips back and forth is is just not a, a good idea. So. Um, this parking is our attempt to kind of get out ahead of it, and that's why we want to buy this extra parcel is to make sure that we have ample parking to really contain everything that we, we need for, for now. Um, I, yeah, I can't make any promises about um, the future. It's not our intention to be back anytime soon before you saying, oh, it's about that. Uh, we need more and we need this and, and we need that. This, this seems to be what we need for the foreseeable future. If the business continues to grow, we'll have to cross that bridge when we come to it. If it's start the building, if it's parking, um, we'll, we'll just need to um, figure that out. But right now, it's not our intention to be back in front of you anytime in the near future asking for anything more. Thank you. Thank you. Robin? So it's my understanding that how contract zoning works is we have something that you want, so you're going to give us something that you have. You have space, you have trees, give us a conservation easement. Has anybody talked to you about saving those trees right there on the, on the riverbank? Um, because that would be a, a tremendous benefit if you would definitely consider and put that in here. And I guess I have a question for staff. Um, are all the elements of the contract zone requirement, um, I'm looking at page um, eight in uh, sections one, two, five um, for contract zoning agreement. And so all of the same 
contract zoning requirements should be in the agreement between the town council and the, the, the landowner, correct? Uh, yes, generally what we see is an amendment to the, the, the right. first contract and yep. then there's a... Because I'm not seeing that the, the current plans. agreement necessarily talks specifically about preservation of open space buffers and protection of natural areas, which is why I brought this up to say, hey, let's, let's, let's talk about this. You're, you guys have expanded very quickly, and the expansion, can, it can only expand so quickly and so big kind of a thing in Scarborough. So what I'm proposing is maybe that we send something back to the town council that says, hey, you know what, this growth is enough. And let's ask that the, the landowner be willing to put that beautiful, varied, and differing growth there that is along Willow Brook into t some type of conservation easement so that the, the <coughs> brook is, is, is um, maintained in perpetuity. Um, the other thing I guess I would, I would think about is what it is that the contract, and I'm looking at section seven of what the um, contract zone agreement should be. I'm not seeing in the agreement right now that contributions toward the provision of municipal services um, has been addressed or the provisions for enforcement and remedies for breach of any conditions or, or restrictions. And that's really what Susan was talking about is that breach of current conditions and restrictions. So I'd like to see the language in the agreement beefed up around six, seven, eight, and nine. And nine is the dedication of land for public purposes. And so again, herein lies the reason for the conservation easement and the way to um, basically um, sort of put some checks and balances on the growth in this area. Okay. And, and really, it's, it's about public benefit. The contract zoning is in place to maximize the public benefit for this give and take between the commercial landowner and the town itself. Mm -hmm. So if we could really memorialize and maximize that public benefit, um, I guess that's the, the note I would like taken to the town council from my behalf. Okay. Thanks, Robin. I agree with that, and I think it's, it's helpful to remind ourselves and the applicant and, and the public as well periodically you know, what the contract zones are really about. I know some of us have historically had kind of mixed feelings about them. They definitely can achieve some good things if administered properly. And so, yeah, I would, I would echo uh, what Ms. Saunders said about sort of keeping those things in mind and, and focusing on that going forward. Um, there were some other, you know, good, good comments, uh, sort of typical to sketch plan review around, you know, at this stage, we're sort of anticipating things we don't have yet, with the stormwater analysis and the auto turn simulation, more detailed landscape plan. Um, I guess you know you 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 wanted some some feedback from, and input from us. My my big personal piece of input is please please reevaluate and reconsider whether you need all that parking. Um, I could lead, I feel like I could lead a tour around Scarborough of overbuilt parking. Um, we could start at exit 42 at the Cabela's complex and go all over town. And I, I fully understand the need to um, meet your, op your operational requirements in a safe and efficient way uh, and, and to anticipate growth within reason. But, you know, there's the old saying about not necessarily wanting to design the church for, for Easter Sunday. Um, and I, I just, that's a lot of pavement for an area which, as has been pointed out, is adjacent to a threatened watershed uh, that feeds directly into the marsh. Um, so I hope you will um, take a look at that. And, you know, I, I do respect and understand the, the imperative of, of uh, being part of, being a franchise uh, and, and upholding those, those branding and branding obligations, so to speak, but we've had a lot of different discussions with different applicants, uh, whether it be fast food chains or, or whatever, where we're, we're told, well, we, know we have to do this. This is a requirement. This is what corporate wants. And then uh, if we push back, lo and behold, we find that there actually is some flexibility there. Mm -hmm. So uh, you clearly want to be in Scarborough. You clearly want to continue to grow in Scarborough. So I would just ask you to please make the effort to reevaluate that 
and to the extent that you can um, you can do with less parking, I would encourage you to pursue that um, with your corporate parent uh, or whatever other process you might need to go through. So that's my big message. Beyond that, I think we've touched on all the, again, the typical sketch plan items. And um, can I but do you have any other? Yes, Susan. Yeah, I would just like to <clears throat> take a second to um, second what Robin said about the um, setting aside the land in some kind of easement because um, I'm one of those people who traditionally has to be very careful how I talk about comp uh, talk about these kinds of um, plans because I, I personally don't like them. And if we can get something where the town gets something back that is actually tangible, because it's supposed to be a win-win for everybody, um, I really would like to vote for that. And also the thing with parking doesn't say that you have to give up the land. You know, it can be there, and as you need to use it for parking, you can convert it to parking. So at least think about that as well. So thank you. Thank you. Um, is there any other feedback you could use from us at this point? Nope. I think okay. uh, we got it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Item number eight on the agenda, Bell Atlantic Mobile of Allentown doing business as Verizon Wireless requests a site plan review for 415 Black Point Road, Assessor's Map, R103, Lot 17A. I'll let Jay introduce this one. Sure, thank you very much. <clears throat> so let's say this item was before the board uh, maybe two or three meetings ago for an initial review. Um, and at that time, board members had a, a series of questions which the applicant has sought to uh, revise their materials and bring forward uh, most predominantly, I think, uh, around the visual impact analysis and some further clarification around the priority of location uh, materials. Um, but one of the things I did hear some board members asking questions about was a little bit, um, maybe just talk a little bit more about the history of the adoption of the uh, uh, transmission tower overlay district. And so just, you know, to touch on a, a few things that, um, so this was a uh, performance standards and zoning that was drafted or adopted in 2014. Um, it was a many month long uh, process. Uh, which really uh, began with uh, the town receiving and considering coverage analysis and assessment uh, by a consultant that was selected. It was actually IDK consultants who board members might recognize that name. They were actually uh, submitted a, a memorandum on behalf of um, a, a member of the public uh, uh, for this application. Um, uh, but they're, they're, they help the town really help us understand uh, our gaps in coverage. And really looking at those gaps in coverage, identify potential facility locations to address those gaps. The community then sort of worked with that information, if you will, to hone in where would be um, based on public input as well as the uh, analysis, where would be appropriate areas to at least allow for um, the siting of facilities, and so um, that's where the transportation overlay uh, districts were created, and those are actually, Jamel just brought that up on the, on the map there to show where those four areas are. You can see there's three smaller pods, if you will, on the, uh, so I'll say, east side of the turnpike, and then by and large, uh, almost all of the west side of the turnpike is in that transportation, uh, sorry, uh, uh, transmission tower overlay district. Um, and so in the last four years since the uh, ordinance was adopted, this board has been through two other tower reviews, which have both been on that west side um, uh, of, of the turnpike. Um, so that's just a bit of a synopsis of sort of how we derived at sort of these, uh, these four areas. Um, then the community obviously also developed a host of performance standards. It says, okay. Yes, potentially a tower could go here, but there's certain things you need to do. And so I think a couple of the things that the board really um, might want to hone in on tonight are the first sort of 
threshold or prior or, or question is sort of this priority of locations. And I, I know I went through it last time, but I think it's just worth echoing again that really the first stipulation that an applicant is asked to do is demonstrate um, can they locate on an existing tower to service the needs. If the board finds that there's a location to do that, then that's sort of what, what the direction should be. If the board and, and the evidence demonstrates that that can't be met, the second priority is a, is a new tower in an industrial, <coughs> industrial or light industrial um, <coughs> district. And again, sort of go through the process of elimination, if you will. Um, should the board find that, you know, again, that, that wouldn't service the desired the, uh, service area. The third uh, priority is a new telecommunication facility. And a telecommunication facility is, is really an antenna that's attached to an existing building or structure. Um, you know, sometimes they've been uh, 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 permitted in, in church steeples. We have uh, at least one or two of those in town. Um, again, if that priority of location is sort of eliminated through the process, the final bit is uh, allowing a new transmission tower in the transmission overlay district. That's when, you know, presuming the board gets through the priority of locations, then we start to apply all those standards that are laid out, those performance standards that are laid out in the zoning ordinance, um, and particularly around sort of the buffering, visual impact analysis, co-location, abandonment, and all those sort of other elements. Um, and again, I know the applicant, last time we didn't have that visual impact analysis study done, and, and I think that's part of what we'll be discussing tonight, I'm sure. Um, so just in terms of those review elements, a few of the elements that we're, we still uh, need to be submitted before board can sort of take final action on this would be at least the uh, uh, co-location documentation. Unless, and I, it, is, it is worth noting and important to note that that is an element that the board finds um, for, and it's spelled out in the ordinance for the reasons these, uh, for the reasons spelled out in the ordinance that co-location uh, isn't feasible. The board can waive that requirement, but um, um, so I just need to stipulate that. And then the other uh, piece that we still haven't seen is sort of the abandonment documentation. Um, I will say in terms of co-location, that is one of the sort of desired outcomes of the uh, transmission tower ordinance language is to minimize the number of towers that are needed in town to sort of service the community. Um, and so again, that's part of the uh, uh, iteration of work that board and applicant need to go through us thinking about these things. Um, I think with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jay. It was a good, a good uh, recap. Uh, so just before we turn it over to the to the applicant and, and move forward, I, I just want to, uh, and Jay alluded to it briefly just now, uh, just wanted to make clear that this board won't be taking any uh, final action on anything tonight. This is just another step, an important step um, in what will, is a very delib intentionally deliberative process. Um, and we're going to do a lot of listening, listening to the applicant's team listening to the public. We have a lot of correspondence that we've received, which we appreciate. Uh, we have multiple peer review documents that we've received, um, which we will continue to digest. And as Jay alluded to, there are some, some, uh, some pieces that will be forthcoming beyond what we have already. Uh, so again, this is, this is really intentionally laid out to be a very deliberative process, and the burden is really on the applicant to demonstrate that they've done their homework and they've They've really uh, considered all, all potential alternatives. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to the applicant. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Scott Anderson for Verizon Wireless, and I'm here this evening with Chip Fredette, who I know you've met and uh, ran the, kind of the presentation last time. We also have Keith Valente from C Squared Systems. He's our <coughs> radio frequency engineer that has both provided some information to the board in the initial application about our need for this site and um, also has provided some of the information in the most recent submittal that we've made. Um, we've gone through the kind of the basic nuts and bolts of the site. What we did since the, the meeting in March is we listened to questions and comments that we got from the board, some questions and comments from uh, members of the public that provided comment. We tried to pull together information to provide you uh, with some responses, um, at least initially, to some of those questions that came up for your consideration. And then in kind of communicating with Jay 
uh, immediately prior to this meeting, he noted that there's a lot of public interest and we want to make sure that there's time for adequate time for public comment and for board questions. So what we're inclined to do is kind of go through specifically what new information we've given you. Jay assured me that everyone has read the, the, the material, so we won't belabor a lot of the stuff you've already seen. But we'll go through some of the new materials, try to address some of the staff comments and maybe a few of the comments in the MGP third party revo report. And then we're here to answer your questions, listen to comments from the public, and keep going with the process that the chairman has identified. And we agree, we're, we're here to make sure that we uh, can kind of respond to questions um, and make sure you've got all the information you need before you kind of move on to deliberations and any kind of discussion. So very, very briefly, nothing about the actual um, um, components of the project has changed since the last time we met with you. It's a 100-foot tower on the Scarborough Sanitary District property. Um, we've got the tower plus our associated equipment, which is um, um, uh, the, the uh, electrical cabinets and a backup generator and a battery at the bottom. But obviously the primary component of the development is the tower itself. We identified in the original application um, the coverage gap that we have in this area of Scarborough. Um, as, as Jay noted, I think AT&T as well participated and Verizon participated in that proceeding uh, back when, when the town revised its ordinance and we kind of provided some information, at least from our perspective, and I think AT&T did the same, as to where we anticipated there being challenging areas, and this was certainly one of them. Um, so we have some coverage problems in this area, and um, we have gone through the priority of locations information, at least initially, to explain to you why we've evaluated and, and rejected um, the possibility of existing towers, the industrial district, or any um, uh, existing structures. Um, but since the, the initial meeting, we've uh, pulled together some additional information, and I just kind of want to go through that briefly. First, the visual assessment, which are the photo simulations that are attached at exhibit, I, be, I believe it's D of your supplemental packet. Um, we had tried to do a balloon test, but the weather did not cooperate, so we brought in a crane, which gives us a similar accuracy in identifying where the top of the tower will be. And then as, I think as we discussed, there's really two components of the visual impact test. And if you're following along your packets on page four at tab D, it shows um, the areas where we drove to identify where the, the tower might be visible from public roads. The areas that are shown in red are areas in the road system where you cannot see the tower. And the few areas in green are locations where uh, the engineers were able to identify the tower um, when, the, when the crane was up. And then what they do is they take those pictures of the crane, go back uh, on the computer, and we provided simulations both of a so-called monopole, which is your standard uh, wireless tower um, with the kind of flat gray, um, not lattice, but a single uh, pole design with the array on top. And we also provided a simulation showing a uh, monopine, or if we do the pole with a branch system on the top section of the, of the pole to kind of make it look like the surrounding pine trees. Now, um, I think, you know, when we go through the visual impact assessment ourselves, we have a general sense of what we think it might look like, but the, um, the visual impact um, simulations are important, um, especially when you're taking a look at, you know, whether or not a monopine will work. And um, our initial sense is that from all but a couple of locations, even the areas where um, the, the top of the crane was visible, um, the distances of 3,000 to 9,000 feet away, where you're you know, over a half mile to over a mile and close to two miles away, um, the, the visual impact of a tower at that distance, when it's only 100 feet uh, tall, is very, very minor. But obviously, we provided you the sim, so you can go through them page by page and, and kind of evaluate your thoughts on the visual impact. Um, so both from the, the perspective of the road system um, and from the number of locations where it can be seen, we don't have any visual uh, impacts in close proximity to the tower. Uh, most of them are very, very far away, and, and you can see in the, in the packet um, um, the, the, the difference between the tower and the monopole uh, the, the, and the monopine. Also, in response to a couple of the staff questions, at 100 feet, the tower will not be lit. Um, so there'll be no lighting on the pole, regardless of which design um, we proceeded with. Um, there will be lights down at the uh, uh, where the equipment is, kind of motion detection lights. Um, uh, the, uh, these will be on a switch. Um, 
these are used very infrequently. The site is visited approximately once a month by a Verizon technician. They're, they're coming during business hours, so most of the time they're there during the day. Uh, the only time the lighting at the base works and is used is if there's an emergency, which is very infrequent. And um, given the, 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 the distance from property lines the, the, and the down direction and nature of the lights, there won't be any visual impacts um, beyond the property line. Um, and then finally, as far as design, we think the monopine looks best, but again, the SIMs are there for you to assess and review and, and uh, give us your thoughts and questions. The second um, um, kind of category of information that we provided in the supplemental submission had to do with um, some <coughs> questions about alternative sites going to the priority of locations. We had asked Keith Valente to look at whether uh, there were any um, existing structures. This is kind of number three on Jay's list of priority of, of, of uh, locations. And we looked at the Black Point Inn as an existing structure with some level of elevation above grade, above, above sea level, that um, is somewhat close to where the coverage uh, gap was in this area. Um, Keith has submitted as part of the supplemental packet we gave you an RF report in which he evaluated um, the coverage from the Black Point Inn, I believe at 45 feet, um, and the plots that go with the coverage from that height and concluded that it does not adequately meet the coverage objectives. Um, you can kind of compare those to the plots that we did in the original application, and there are significant areas where from the Black Point Inn um, uh, 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 antennas at that level will not uh, meet the coverage um, uh, goals of the project. Um, you folks have retained um, Modern Grid Partners as your third party radio frequency reviewer to review Keith's work. And on the issue of the Black Point Inn, I think uh, fair to read their report as saying they concur with Keith's assessment that the inn does not work. There were two other locations um, that, um, that we had talked about at the last meeting. One was um, a church steeple at 167 Black Point Road, and the second was a Black Point Fire Station. And uh, Chip is the site acquisition uh, gentleman who's been on the ground evaluating all these sites. So I, I think it'd probably be best if he came up and just talked about those two sites um, and, and give you a kind of response as to why those sites um, um, are not on our on our list for this project. Hi, folks. Again, Chip Fredette here on behalf of Verizon Wireless. Uh, yeah, the two, the two other uh, locations that Scott referred to, one being the uh, church steeple at 167 Black Point Road, and the other being the uh, flagpole at the fire station. Um, the Black Point Road church uh, is a good idea, and so good, in fact, we're actually already in that steeple. Um, we're operating from that. That's our Scarborough 3 site. Again, that was one that we permitted uh, through the town, uh, building permit only, if you will, under the new ordinance as an existing structure that would work for a co-location. Uh, we had a gap in coverage there. Uh, I found that to be a possible candidate. Our engineers agreed. We deployed in that, and we're operating from that site, and that is in the original application there uh, in the propagation maps. So uh, we like the church steeple. We're using it. It's a great idea. Um, the uh, flagpole at the fire station, to begin with, uh, is at the very outskirts of the search ring. <clears throat> uh, the other issue is that the flagpole itself was designed for only that which equipment's on it right now. And we have the, we have the tower design uh, done by Paul Ford, and I'm happy to send that to staff, and they can send it off to Modern Grid for, for their review. So it wasn't designed to hold any more equipment than you've got there now. So um, again, assessing the kind of the three alternatives in addition to what we had looked at before, um, um, the, the site that we've chosen here we think is necessary to fill this coverage gap. We've evaluated whether there are any existing telecommunications towers um, and have concluded that, that, that there are none. Um, the industrial district is too far away from this area of Scarborough, such that if we put a tower in the industrial district or light industrial, we could cover this area. And um, whether it's the existing uh, flagpole at the fire station or the um, Black Point Inn, those existing structures uh, don't work um, either because of propagation and coverage issues or structural. The issue with the, the fire station, there's also not enough um, area at the, uh, on the site to to locate equipment, so 
Um, as opposed to the site that we're developing here, you'll, you'll see I think there's a 50 by 50 foot fenced area around the base of the tower, and that's, that's done at that size so that we've got enough room to put our equipment in and theoretically other co-locators, and we don't have that option at the, at the fire station. So um, we have taken a look at both the MGP um, third-party review, which we think uh, basically agrees with the assessment that we've done. We also reviewed the IDK communication submittal uh, from Ivan, who has been retained by some of the neighbors to evaluate this as well. And, and we appreciate, uh, you know, we had worked with Ivan um, and his group uh, and his company when, um, as part of this process of designing um, the town's uh, ordinance and, you know, helping to identify this area as a potentially good site for a new tower. Um, we appreciate IDK's they have a couple of recommendations. They suggest potentially you could do this as a kind of stealth stick or a flagpole site in order to avoid the visual impacts of the array on top. Um, that is always an option, although as uh, IDK mentioned in their report, um, <coughs> normally you have to make the, the tower taller for that because instead of being able to put all the antennas on one elevation, to hit the directions you're trying to cover, you have to stack them because the, the, the space inside the pole is much smaller and you can only put a few antennas at each elevation. So as a result, the tower would need to be higher in order to do it. So you would avoid potentially the visual impacts of the array, but we think when you go through the visual impact, what, what is really important about this project is the 100-foot level that we're proposing. That's all that Verizon Wireless needs in order to meet its coverage objectives at this site. Um, we don't have information about what other companies need uh, or what other companies might have issues in this area, and that's largely because the, each company's radio frequency and coverage information is proprietary information and it's not shared between the carriers. So we can identify and we work with Keith to identify what we need and where the location is and at what elevation in order to connect with other, other sites. Um, but we would be guessing if we kind of offered an opinion about what we thought other carriers might need and really whether anyone will ever come to this site to seek co-location. So we've designed a pole that, as we've noted in the plans, will hold up to three additional antenna arrays, so it is strong enough to do that. And we believe there is room at the bottom of the pole in order for three additional carriers to put their equipment without having to bump out the fence and do any significant gymnastics at the base. So the, the tower is certainly capable of accommodating co-location. We are um, going to kind of Jay's point, um, and we'll, we'll work with Jay and you folks to figure out what additional information. We're required by the terms of our FCC license to make all of our sites available to other carriers. And as a practical business thing, we're always looking to go on A&T and T's poles and T-Mobile's poles, so the companies are pretty good about working together. So this will be designed uh, to, to uh, handle co-location. Normally we provide a, a letter to the municipality from somebody with more authority than, than I have to make it clear that we will make the space available under commercially reasonable terms and respond to requests in a timely manner, and there's some stuff that we've done, but we can figure out with Jay and, and you folks what you need for that. But that is part of our normal day-to-day -day operations and co-location. Um, our concern, of course, would be to build this tower higher than we need it because it could be months or years or never before anyone else comes and decides to go on the tower. And if they do, based on their coverage, they might be fine at 87 feet or 77 feet. Um, and so we won't know until that day happens. And then I think what the board does, if AT&T and t comes in and they want to put um, a tower someplace else, you would ask for an evaluation of why it couldn't go on our tower. You might decide that the, the, what was necessary to extend this tower was not as good as actually doing a different pole someplace else. AT&T might be able to go someplace else with a smaller pole with very limited visual impact. So these are all good questions, but we won't have any information in this proceeding to kind of figure out who might be coming down the pike next. So what we always try to do is make sure that we are proposing a tower that is as low as it can be while still meeting our coverage objectives, and that's what we've done with this site. Um, finally, um, there were a lot of good questions that came up in the March meeting about environmental assessment and environmental impacts. And so we work with EBI Consulting on most of the sites that we do. 
they assist us with proceedings like this. Um, they also help us if we're doing any kind of NERPA permitting or wetland permitting with the state. And they're also responsible for accumulating all the information we have to do under, uh, under federal review where we have to identify historic properties and habitat areas and, and other items that, that are tied to our FCC license. So um, EBI provided some reports to the board on two issues. One, general environmental impacts, meaning what did we find with regard to habitat on site or in the vicinity, and what impacts might you expect from the construction of this tower on those habitat areas? And um, that is a review that involves both uh, federal listed species, state beginning with habitat maps, and some of the other issues that we talked about at the last meeting. Um, basically, this is a um, existing developed site um, as you all know, there is a significant footprint for the sanitary district, um, wastewater treatment system. There are other areas that have been kind of converted to, to grass and that are mowed. And then you have the more forested area, and we're going kind of on the edge of the forested and the grass area. So EBI concluded after reviewing all the available material that there are some endangered species in the area, the piping plover and the northern long-eared bat, um, but there is no habitat on site for either of those species. Um, and with bats, you look at, um, I always get this pronunciation wrong, uh, hibernaculums. There are no essentially nests and no roosting areas within 150 feet. Those are the US Fish and Wildlife Service guidelines that the, especially the Army Corps looks at. So we don't have any uh, anticipated adverse impacts to the northern long-eared bat, and we don't have any uh, uh, anticipated adverse impact to the piping plover. There's no habitat uh, on site for, for that species. And again, part of the reason why this is a good, a good site for us is because it's already essentially an industrial uh, site, and we're trying to locate um, uh, not in an undeveloped area, uh, but next to where you've got a lot of existing development. The other item that we asked EBI to look at, because there were questions, is migratory bird impacts. The trick here, of course, is a better part of the eastern seaboard is part of the migratory bird area. So everything that's happening along the coast potentially has an impact there. But US Fish and Wildlife Service issues uh, tower uh, siting and construction guidelines that we have tried to follow to the greatest extent possible. Um, uh, namely, the tower is, is half of fish and wildlife's capped 199 feet where they have concern, so we're well below the, that height level of concern. Um, there are no guy wires. This will be a self-standing tower regardless of what design uh, would ultimately be, be chosen. Um, and there's no lighting on the tower. The other, um, and so those are three kind of risk factors for migratory birds. The wires, the lighting, which draws them close by, um, and then the height. Also, um, you know, the, the antennas need to be somewhat above the tree canopy, but there are a few trees in proximity to the site that are actually quite tall, if not the same tight as, a, as our proposed tower. EBI considered those. And because we're not uh, projecting that uh, far above the, the canopy, that's another factor in the siting uh, guidelines. We're not in the middle of a big field where geese are landing taking a break, and then you've got this huge tower in the middle. We're largely surrounded by existing tall, mature vegetation, which, which basically prevents the birds from swooping down low to, to hit something new. So based on the Fish and Wildlife Sighting Guidelines, EBI Consulting has concluded that they're not anticipating any significant adverse impact to migratory birds. And I thought it was also helpful that your consulting engineer, MGP, made a kind of a general comment that they thought that EBI was, you know, one of the first class folks in their field and knew who they were and had no reason to believe that they were uh, anything but, but uh, um, uh, diligent in reaching their conclusions. Um, finally, there were two other items that came up in the, the staff comments. One, abandonment. Um, I do not believe we have language in the lease that goes to this issue, but normally what we do is provide a, some sort of performance guarantee for the town in an amount equal to what the code officer believes it would cost to take the tower down. And then a normal condition of approval would be if this thing is shut off for whatever time period, usually it's a year, um, we're required to remove it and restore the site. And if we don't do that, um, then you would have a performance bond to draw down immediately to, to have the work covered. Um, and we would provide that uh, to the town at whatever point in the process you know, made sense to you folks. So um, we, would, we would make sure that if it's abandoned, 
If we don't take it down, you will have the money in hand at no cost to the taxpayers to remove it and restore the site, and that number would be confirmed by the town staff. Um, also, the staff had asked for some specs on the crushed stone. This is pretty much standard crushed stone that you'd use in a gravel driveway, but we can get some additional information for the staff and the board um, as your uh, review continues. Um, so I think those are the new items and the new information that we have provided to you. Um, we are here for any questions that the board has and otherwise to listen to public comment um, and take diligent notes as the process moves forward. Thank you. Uh, so uh, before we have board discussion, uh, we will open this up for public comment. Um, again, as stated earlier this evening, um, just ask that people give their name and address, uh, keep comments to five minutes or less, try not to be too repetitive uh, if, you, if you can. Um, and also, as we, as we and our staff say to our applicants, um, you can be confident that if you submitted something in writing, we have read it and it's part of the record um, and we appreciate it. Um, so I understand that some folks might want to repeat or amplify certain things that they put in writing and that's perfectly fine, but I just put that out there um, that, you, that you take that into consideration. Um, and as also mentioned earlier tonight, to the extent that there are any questions or comments that need to be redirected to the applicants team, uh, the board will, will do that. Uh, we won't have you know, direct back and forth between the public and, and the applicant. Um, and um, we will uh, have a good uh, discussion. So with that, I will open it up to public comment. Is this on? Is this on? Yes. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Lucy LaCase, and if you don't mind, I'm going to read this because it's. I want to make sure I say what I intended to. My name is Lucy LaCase, and I live at 52 Old Neck Road in Scarborough. My husband and I have been Scarborough residents for 37 years. Our first home was out on the Burnham Road, and we moved to our current home on the Marsh in 2000. We were drawn, as so many are, to the Scarborough Marsh's extraordinary beauty, its ecological richness, and to its recreational opportunities. We feel tremendously fortunate to live alongside such splendor, and we strongly oppose Verizon's proposal for a 100-foot expandable cell tower at 415 Black Point Road on the edge of the Libby River. One of the justifications for the cell tower is supposed need. We question that need. We are Verizon customers, have been forever, and our cell service is perfectly adequate throughout the area, including right at the entrance to the sanitary district, where I get four bars. Verizon claims that the tower is to provide increased coverage for the Prouts Neck area. The coverage is just fine out there, and the negative aspects of this project far outweigh any modest boost of service that would be gained. It feels to us like Verizon is just trying to establish some vertical real estate at the expense of our town's greatest asset, the Scarborough Marsh. And we suspect that 100 feet is just the start. At the March 12th planning board meeting, the Verizon representative said they'd probably have to raise the tower to accommodate the co-location of the three additional antenna arrays. This feels like a really slippery slope, representing a really bad mistake if approved. Besides their claim for need, we also challenge Verizon's claim for, of adequate buffering. There is practically no vegetative buffering between the proposed tower and the Libby River area of the Scarborough Marsh. This alone should render the proposal unacceptable. Countless visitors and residents come to the Scarborough Marsh to bird wash, watch, fish, and paddle, or to simply enjoy its glory. Please do not spoil this amazing landscape with an unsightly industrial edifice. Additionally, we feel that Verizon does not adequately acknowledge the ecological value and fragility of the area. There are four, not three as they claim, nationally designated important bird areas within close proximity to the proposed site, including the Scarborough Marsh, Western Beach, Pine Point Beach, and Stratton and Bluff Islands. Of those four IBAs, the Scarborough Marsh is the most valued from an ecological perspective because it provides foraging grounds for so many species, including federally endangered roseate terns and piping plovers, and state endangered least terns. These birds, along with many herons, egrets, and shorebirds, travel between the marsh, the beaches, and the islands, often crossing that thinnest portion of land between the marsh and Massacre Pond, 
which happens to be the sanitary district property. Avian mortality is a very legitimate concern for this part project. Horizon has also not assessed the impact of this proposed construction on the local population of the state endangered New England cottontail. If this project moves forward beyond this evening, the town should insist upon an environmental impact statement to determine the project's effect on New England cottontails and on avian movement and mortality across the property. Our town has always recognized the tremendous value of the Scarborough Marsh. In working to develop Scarborough's new, com new comprehensive plan, one of the takeaways from last September's Plan of Palooza was that the Scarborough Marsh is our town identity. How true. The Scarborough Marsh is the largest salt marsh in the state, and it is truly the jewel in Scarborough's crown. Why would we blemish it? And the town appears committed to creating a new comprehensive plan that is, in your own words, guided by core fundamental principles, including operating in a manner that conserves and safeguards natural resources, becoming a model of environmental stewardship and managing the town's resources wisely to support present and future generations. So why on earth would you approve a large cellular transmission tower that would create such a blight on our town's greatest resource, the Scarborough Marsh, the essence of Scarborough's identity? Now, I understand that in 2014, the town council approved 415 Black Point Road as a transmission tower overlay district. Apparently, the vote was four to three. It was clearly a clouded issue. While we appreciate the hard work and the commitment of our town officials, we feel that they made a big mistake in that designation. They were not following their own 2006 comprehensive plan, which designated that area as a rural residential and conservation district. In an update to that 2006 plan, Action C3D states that, quote, the town should consider additional regulatory measures beyond those already in place that would protect the town's river corridors and lands adjacent to the Scarborough Marsh. The town was clearly acting in complete opposition to its own comprehensive plan when it approved 415 Black Point Road as an overlay site. Let's not follow one mistake with another. You, as our planning board, have the opportunity, here and now, to be guided by Scarborough's core fundamental principles and to conserve and safeguard our natural resources for present and future generations. Please do the right thing. I know that you have received lots of letters from community members about this proposal. I have read them, all 121 of them. The 121 letters and comments represent 113 organizations and individuals. A few of us wrote multiple letters. Involved organizations include the Scarborough Land Trust, Friends of Scarborough Marsh, Maine Audubon, National Audubon, Prout Snack Audubon, Nunsuch Orrin Paddle, Prout Snack Association, and the Prout Snack Country Club, each of which expressed either direct opposition or raised significant concerns about excuse me, Verizon's proposal. Of those 113 individuals and organizations that sent letter to the planning board, only four, yes, four, out of 113, expressed clear support. Wow. That's a pretty significant statement of opposition and concern. And 121 total letters may even be a record for citizen involvement in a site plan review. I don't know. But it's a clear sign that people really care about this issue and that they really care about the Scarborough Marsh. Please, we implore you to listen to the people. We implore you to reject Verizon's application. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Beth Rockefeller. I'm the past president of the Proud Snack Country Club. I'm here tonight representing both the Country Club and myself as a homeowner at One Smithers Way, a full-time resident of Scarborough. Um, the Proud Snack Country Club is a direct abutter to the property and the cell tower, and it is noted as one of the dead zones that is trying to be covered or addressed, as is my home on One Smithers Way. First of all, the country club does not allow cell phones of any kind on its property. So there is no need for any improved coverage at all. We would appreciate no coverage in that area. As for my own home, which is at One Smithers Way, directly across from the country club, I am in that dead zone, and I have very good Verizon coverage. And if there's any problem, it just switches to Wi-Fi in my own home. And I walk the entire area all the time and never have a problem with coverage. 
as we were listening to other proposals tonight, we talked about um, auto dealerships on Route 1 not being ideal. I think a cell tower in the beautiful marsh is not what we want to do. Just as you want to conserve by the Land Rover, the, uh, the river, and those things, please conserve our marsh and the views, and do not put a cell tower there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eliza Lee, and I live at 47 Winslow Homer Road. Um, I appreciate the hard work of the planning committee, and Corey, I also appreciate that you're taking a deliberate approach to this issue. Um, as a resident who also, with others, loves the natural beauty of this area, I have some serious concerns about the viewshed impact of this proposed tower. I read the 2008 State Scenic Assessment Handbook, and while I don't have all the details, I understand that technically there are many views around Black Point Road, Pine Point, and the Scarborough Marsh and Scarborough State Beach that should be preserved in perpetuity. I understand it's not a legal document, um, but I really think it's important, and I hope that this the State Planning Office did a lot of work to put it together, and I hope that that has been reviewed um, by you, and I think it's an important document to consider in this project. Um, as others have said, the visual resources of this area are crucial. I, I also believe they're crucial to the economic health of Scarborough. People come from all over the state of Maine and the country to enjoy the marsh and the beach. Um, so I strongly urge you to consider either alternative technologies or alternative locations for this project. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Brad Willauer. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I live at 8 Sanctuary Lane, which is more or less in the middle of Prout's Neck. And since we're talking about height at 137 feet, it's my, it's my land. Uh, I live in my great-grandfather's garage, slightly enlarged from its 500 feet, square feet when it was built some years ago in 1911. I'm here speaking for my late brother, Charles Homer, and my great-great-grandfather, our great-great-grandfather, Charles Savage Homer. And I have him a couple of reasons to thank him. The first is that he sired my great-grandfather, Arthur Homer. He also sired Winslow Homer. The next thing he did that was important is, is he bought 65% of Prout Snack in 1878, which was a cleared farm. Because he thought he might make, make a few bucks doing it, and I guess maybe he did. But, uh, I, and I, I also am here representing my brother-in-law sitting over there, <clears throat> he and I, his sister, who's my wife, of course, uh, my father, his father, uh, my brother, who I just mentioned, have all served in the various boards of these organizations you're talking about. My brother, my late brother, Charles, who passed away five years ago, was the person who made, made it possible that the state of Maine and Prout's Neck and Scarborough has the Winslow Homer Studio. Not my kids, my brother's kids, but all of you. So when I think about this, and I should probably digress for a second, because I chaired a planning board in Denham, Massachusetts for five years uh, before, well, before coming up here 35 years ago. So I know a little bit about what you're doing. I sure wish I had the staff that you have. Uh, we only, we were nowhere, nowhere near as well served as I understand you are. So I encourage you to pay attention to your staff, and I encourage you to think about the comprehensive plan, and, uh, and most importantly, remember that the decision you make on this is, isn't going to go away. You're not going to reverse it one step in. 
you, you know that this this would never be reverted unless uh, technology completely changes beyond anything I can think of. So if you will, think of the traditions of Scarborough. I don't play golf very often, as everybody in the room here that knows me uh, knows, but when I do, I go out there and I see the plaque of the church that was built there in 1658, destroyed by good friends from France, uh, who came down and wiped everybody out, as you know, back then. A lot of tradition here in, in, in this part of the world, and I don't think we need to have uh, the applicant's proposal approved. I just wanted to pass out as I give out, as a, as a uh, thank you for your work, just a little piece that, that we put together that reminds you and me, because I had to reread it to remember it, that uh, the conservation plan, the comprehensive plan, speaks about Prout's Neck and its views, and of course towers affect views. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Pratt. I'm a resident of Two Seal Rock Drive um, in Scarborough, and I would like to thank the council for their focus and work on this issue and other issues. Um, I'm also a trustee of the Prout Snack Association, um, and we have expressed um, through a letter, um, and I won't repeat the content because I think it's it's been, you know, well well explained already by some others here. But um, we are very concerned about the buffering, the view shed and the potential for you know, other co-location uh, towers. And um, we, we want to be very helpful um, to the committee. Um, we have retained the services of um, Natalie Burns, who's, I think, um, quite, quite familiar to you from Jensen, Barrett, and Gardner. Um, Ivan, um, who was mentioned a few times tonight from IDK, who helped come up with the plan for the town and you know, I think has some relevant insight on this issue. Um, and Amy Siegel, um, who's a landscape architect, um, and I would invite them to make some comments tonight. And I think our goal is really to make sure that um, there's some deliberation and consultation, and we appreciate the comments that were made earlier uh, about the need for deliberation. And what we've done is we re really want to make their services available as well, because they've, they've spent a lot of time focusing on this issue. So um, I think at some point they will make some comments and provide some views as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Smith. I live at 7 Audubon Way in Scarborough. I am also president of the board of the Friends of Scarborough Marsh, have been for the last year or so. Um, the Marsh, the Friends of Scarborough Marsh has as its mission to conserve, protect, restore, and enhance the Scarborough Marsh. And among the things that we want to conserve are the vistas, the, the, the wild and remote <coughs> vistas of the marsh that <coughs> draw people, whether they be photographers or artists or kayakers or just people who want to take a look at it. Um, the vistas, the vistas, sometimes my main accent gets in my way. <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, you know, the vistas of the marsh were things that were mentioned in the comprehensive plan as positive attributes of the town. And I think those vistas need to be protected. Um, we're also concerned with the impact on both, not just migratory, but resident bird, bird populations the important bird area is an internationally recognized designation, and the Scarborough Marsh is one of those. And anything we can do to enhance the protection of, of avian life in the marsh, I think, is critical. We, as the Friends of Scarborough Marsh, we've worked with many local and state organizations to protect the marsh from incompatible development. We consider this proposal to be incompatible with the nature of the marsh and the goals of these organizations. Um, just as an aside, when we talked about cell coverage in Scarborough, I, I never have a problem with cell coverage in Scarborough. But I would gladly do with some dead zones if it means protecting the marsh from things like the tower. And I would encourage the planning board to work with 
with Verizon and whomever to find a better solution. And I'm sorry I'm not as eloquent as Lucy, but thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Steve Panette. Um, I'm the Vice President of Friends of Scarborough Marsh Board, and I'd like to echo um, the comments that I've heard before me. Um, I live at 16 Goldwood Drive. Um, my major concern is the vistas, or are the vistas. Um, when I have friends from out of town visit, I take them on bike rides up to um, Proud Snack. I take them down the marsh, the lower Scarborough River. Um, we walk on Pond Point Beach. We kayak out to Ron Stratton Island, Saco Bay. All those locations have uh, vistas of the area that are views of the area that's going to have the tower. And I'm concerned that um, if you want a good photograph of those areas of the marsh from those viewpoints, you need to take them now because they'll be forever marred. Um, you know, it, it is an area that's steeped in tradition. The, you know, the settlers of Scarborough back in the early 1600s uh, settled there because the marsh was where they could safely harvest hay without being attacked by, uh, you know, the aboriginals and, and so on, or, or the French or whomever. Uh, so the marsh has always been a treasure. Um, I wonder if that area was not one of the designated um, tower, you know, um, permitted areas where Verizon would go. Um, you know, there, there are these two areas, and they're both adjacent to the marsh, which is unfortunate. Um, like Lucy said, um, I get five, four or five bars uh, when I'm at Ferry Beach. Right, right in the shadow of this new proposed tower. So I don't understand why there's a where everybody else has a gap. But anyway, I hope you. Um, I guess I hope you consider all other alternatives. There's distributed antenna systems that people are banning about on the internet. Um, those have been put in areas where a 150-foot tower is proposed. They've uh, used distributed system to. Um, obviate the need for a large tower, so I hope you ask the applicant to consider other locations and alternatives. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I will make this very brief. Um, my name is Tricia Newhouse and I live at Three Cricket Lane in Scarborough. Um, I don't have any specific credentials, I'm just here to voice my concern about the tower. And I just want to echo other um, comments that I have impeccable service at my house um, and do not need more coverage. Um, I hope that we'll reconsider this plan and just also to echo that we are so blessed with such a beautiful, incredible, natural gift here and to uh, mar it seems a great shame. Thank you. Thank you. C.D. Armstrong, One High Point Road, Scarborough. Um, thank you for your time tonight. It seems to me, uh, listening to the comments, that there's a lot of issues regarding views and view shed. That's my, my issue as well. I note in the uh, applicant's um, slide on where they took the, uh, the views, uh, the, uh, they were all roads. Uh, I think there are a lot of people who go out on the marsh in, in boats and kayaks. Walking, uh, who, and, and those uh, views I, I don't think were, were noted in the applicant's uh, application, at least that I saw, uh, and probably want to take note of that and, and realize also that if you're out on the marsh, you're down low, and when you're looking from a low position uh, out toward the beach or over the beach, uh, you're probably going to have a better view of the, the cell tower, I'm going to guess. I, I'm not a, a technician, so I'm, I'm just going to guess at that. But uh, when I was out there on the marsh looking when they had the uh, tower out there, I could see it. Uh, I can't see it from my house, but uh, I can, could see it from out of the marsh. Uh, I would also, I guess, invite the board to and staff to um, invite Verizon to figure out a technological solution to staying below the tree level. Uh, if, if the view shed is really what the issue is, then uh, a, a tower that is below the trees within 100 feet or 50 feet or whatever you think is reasonable uh, might satisfy people, but a tower that sticks up 
at least for me and a bunch of other people, is not. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amy Siegel. I'm a landscape architect with Terrence Dewan and Associates. And I was engaged by uh, the Presnick Association to prepare some photo simulations. So I'm gonna hook this up and hope that it comes up here. We, we prepared uh, simulations from four locations of the proposed tower. Uh, this, we did this work uh, prior to um, seeing the work that the applicant has produced. And the intent, the intent of this work, this photo simulation work, is to provide the board with additional information for you to consider. So we looked at, again, four sites. Um, you have back here. So these four, you can see the, cell, the proposed cell tower is kind of in the middle there. And we did these four locations with the four, four red dots. So one's from the Cliff Walk, um, Crowd's Neck, one from Pine Point, sort of toward the east end of the beach, one from Black Point Road over the uh, Libby River, the bridge there, and then one from the Scarborough Marsh, about 2,000 feet just north of the site. So again, in this collection of images, um, starting with the Cliff Walk, you'll see this panoramic image first, and that's just to give some context. And you'll see on the bottom of the image there the technical information shown, the 100-foot cellular tower that's proposed. The middle one is 130 feet, as, as I understand, um, is sort of the uh, with co-location, <laughs> might, might be a height that is um, possible. And then the 150 feet, which is, as I understand is sort of the maximum height. Uh, this again is this image sort of uh, bracketed <coughs> just to look at this specific view. And um, you're looking towards Scarborough Beach from Cliff Walk. And the, you know, showing a 100 foot cellular tower similar to the images that the applicant provided. It's just above the tree line. Um, as it grows to 130 feet, it pops up above the tree line more with more of the antenna visible with 150 feet, even more so. So it's right in the center of the image. Now this distance is, is over a mile, just to give some sense of scale. The next image we looked at is from Black Point Road, looking south. Again, sort of panoramic image, getting you know a good sense of the broad horizontal landscape here with the river um, sort of weaving its way through. You can see the sanitary district through there, uh, kind of buffered, but you can see the roofs of the shed buildings and the tanks. There is a 100-foot cellular tower popping up above the tree line, 130-foot cellular tower, 150-foot cellular tower. Again, this is just under a mile, but clearly it would be a focal point as you're driving across the bridge there. Third location uh, it would be it from the Pine Point, from the beach, to the east end of the beach, and again, sort of public accessible location here, looking across towards Ferry Beach. You'd have, oops, so there's the 100 foot cell tower right sort of at the treetops just above the tree line, 130 feet, 150 feet. And this is sort of, you know, 0.85 miles, so a little, bit, a little bit less than a mile. And then from the Scarborough Marsh, which a lot of folks have spoken about um, already this evening. So. These photographs were taken, this is about 2,000 feet away, um, and we looked at several <coughs> locations. We took, there's photographs taken all through here when the applicant had the crane up. And we felt like this location, um, you know, in fairness, kind of showed the sanitary district. You can see that that buffer isn't so great there. Um, there's some deciduous vegetation there, and you know, you can see that, but it's below the tree line, but you certainly can see it. And, and with this existing conditions here, you can also see just above sort of the edge of the marsh, some of the tanks. And here's a 100 foot cellular tower. So even at 100 feet, you know, just to also point out that there's trees that would be removed, you're gonna see, you're gonna see that tower. You're gonna see the base of the tower, you're gonna see the full array. Because there's not a lot of vegetation to buffer it. 130 feet, 150 feet, so then we also, with um, Ivan's help, sort of thought, got some feedback and thought a little bit more about what some options would be. Um, obviously, I know that the position of the association is that they would prefer to have no tower. Um, but as we looked at some other options of 
for the board just to have some additional information. We looked at the stealth tower, and um, as the applicant mentioned in the beginning, that it would need to be, you know, it, it shows it at 120 feet um, to kind of be complementary to that 130 foot um, cell tower with the array. It's a three and a half foot diameter, you know, uh, cylinder, as we're showing it here. And just to quickly go through this, so again, from a cliff walk, there's a 130 foot cell tower <laughs> in the original location. You know, obviously you're just stripping the uh, antenna off of it, essentially. Here's from Black Point Road, stripping it down to the stealth tower. From Pine Point, stripping it down. And then from the marsh, again, focusing on this 130 foot height as this potential height with co-location. Here would be a stealth tower. Now, um, it, this is sort of a, this timing of day and such shows this as a sort of backlit structure. You're kind of from the north, sort of looking south towards it. Um, if, you know, through the board's prerogative, you can sort of discuss what color paint it could be painted, a stealth tower. So if it was in that blue-gray light color, it may blend better um, with the sky. If it was to move to another location, um, there's also the potential for uh, having more vegetation to buffer more of it. Um, I'm just going to kind of go back here. So I want to mention something before I forget. Um, there's the, the proposed site is in, kind of in line with the three tanks to the south of it. This alternative site um, that I will probably speak about is about 200 feet to the northeast. Um, that's the one you see in this, in the, that, this structure. So that's the proposed existing site. And then that would be that 200 foot shift, which allows for more vegetation to be preserved between the marsh and the structure itself. And again, just sort of ending on the, the idea of if it was painted white or that lighter blue, you know, at certain times of day when the light's reflecting off of it, you would see a lot less of it. So we're trying to simplify and minimize the visual impact as, to the greatest extent. Thank you. And I have copies of that I can drop off. Thank you. My name is Jim Hancock. I live at 47 Old Neck. Some of those pictures that Verizon showed could have been taken up from my window of my home. Um, but I'm obviously concerned about the view, but I still remain more concerned about the natural life and the birds. And I think that the staff at the Maine Audubon provided you all with this, but I'd like to read just a couple of uh, pieces of the recommended best practices for communication tower building, design, construction, and operation, which was put out by the Division of Migratory Bird Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, in August 2016. So it's some <coughs> directives. And just uh, obviously, uh, I'll just do a couple pieces, but one of the phrases I think is important, it, they say, given the height, structural engineering needs, and obstruction, lighting requirements, communication towers may cause direct and indirect bird mortality through collisions, construction, operation, and maintenance activities, and significant loss of fat reserves in adults due to the energy ex expenditure of circling towers. And they go on to, to talk about the siting and construction of new towers, and we've heard all of the priorities that you should go through. But I, I wanted to read one piece that they have under placement. And it says, select already degraded areas for tower placement. Towers should not be sited in or near wetlands, other known bird concentration areas, for example, state or federal refuges, which we of course talking about being right next to, staging areas, rookeries, and important bird areas, or in known migratory bird mo movement routes, daily movement flyways, areas of breeding concentration, and habitat of threatened or endangered species, key habitats for birds of conservation concern, or near the breeding areas of prairie grouse. Well, all of those but the last fit this area that we're talking about. 
And that's just what I wanted to point out. And I believe you have copies of this. Thank you. Hold on. Yes, we do. Thank you. Good evening, members of the planning board. My name is Natalie Burns. I'm with Jensen, Baird, Gardner, and Henry, and I'm here tonight representing the Proud Snack Association. First of all, I want to start out by addressing certain ordinance issues, since that is what this board needs to be looking at. Um, we, we believe that the applicant, uh, which has the burden of proof on all of these issues, um, has failed to meet the standards, uh, at least some of the standards in the ordinance. First of all, uh, in, the tele in the telecommunications tower overlay district section 9.f.1, the construction of a new tower in the TTOD is the lowest priority under the town's ordinance. The applicant has talked about other locations that it's looked at, um, including the church, including the Black Point Inn. We would agree the Black Point Inn is not a feasible alternative, um, not only from their perspective, but also from the perspective of the owners of the Black Point Inn. Um, it is, and there has been some, there has been discussion throughout this application process that the fire station cannot be made to work for this purpose. Um, one of the things that has been said is that there's not room on the ground for additional facilities. Uh, it is not clear from the things that, that we have reviewed exactly why these things couldn't be placed somewhere on that property. It's also not clear why a replacement pole could not be, flagpole could not be installed that was taller. Um, recognizing that there are facilities there and that they are not going to want them turned off, it has not been discussed why a second pole could not be installed and then things transferred over, as has been done in other parts of the state um, when these types of facilities have to be replaced. Uh, <clears throat> It is the applicant's burden under the ordinance to submit substantial evidence and justification to demonstrate that a location of higher priority cannot reasonably accommodate the applicant's proposed facility. We think that the information that's been provided to you to date does not meet that standard in the ordinance. Um, the section, second section that I would like to address is section 9.F.2.A. Uh, Verizon is proposing a 100-foot tower with an additional five feet for the lightning rod. And so all of its submissions, including its visual impact analysis, are based upon that proposal. However, there are only four locations on this for arrays, and one of those will be taken up for, by Verizon. Um, I don't know if this has been determined yet, but there's a possibility that one will be taken up by the town's public safety facilities. Um, if that's true, there's only two arrays left. And of course, the arrays have to be at a height that are usable by people seeking co-location. What this means is that there is a very substantial likelihood that in the future, if someone else wants to co-locate here, this is going to have to get taller. And so we think this board needs to keep that in mind as it's reviewing this proposal and consider the impacts of a taller tower. Um, when Ivan speaks, he's going to talk about 130 feet. That's something that was discussed in the town study back in 2014. Um, of course, the maximum is 150, but it is very likely that this will have to go up to at least 130 feet. And therefore, this board should require that Verizon provide information about what a 130-foot minimum tower will look like, uh, how that will impact the view shed analysis that's been provided to you. In addition, uh, you need to consider how it will impact the required setbacks under the ordinance. The setbacks now in one location, it is the minimum setback required under the ordinance. And so if this gets taller in the future, you're going to be asked to grant a waiver from that setback requirement. Uh, rather than doing so, you should, if you are going to allow a tower, you should consider that that is a very real possibility and require now that it meet those setbacks. Not allow it to, something to come in later and say, well, this is the only location we can go in, which is what Verizon is telling you. Um, and we can't meet the setbacks, so you should 
you should allow them to be waived. Uh, Verizon has stated that it can make the monopole extendable if required by the board. And again, that supports the need for this board to consider it as it will be if it's extended. The next section that I'd like to address is section 9, F2, E, subsection 2. You have seen Amy Siegel's photo simulation. Um, we're not going to pick on Verizon for its photo simulation, but we think that Amy's gave you a better idea of what the possibilities are here. Um, we do think that this has a very significant impact on the view shed, uh, but we do think that uh, Verizon should be asked to go back and redo some of, some of its views. Um, as you may have noticed, some of them were, but the perspective was focused more on the front uh, than it was on the horizon. The view shed analysis needs to look at what the horizon is going to look like with the tower there. And that's what Amy's did, and I think in at least a few uh, of the photographs, Verizon's failed to do that. Second of all, um, underneath this, this provision, um, you can require that uh, it, I'm sorry, under section F2C2, uh, you have to require that there be a buffer of dense tree growth. Amy's simulation again showed that towards the marsh that, that is not met. Um, it has to minimize the visual impact from abutting properties, roadways, and public spaces, and it really is the marsh that we're talking about. And the marsh is, is a public space in the town, and it is probably the, the most uh, valuable public space that the town has in this area. Um, we, would, we would also ask that under that provision of the ordinance, you require a, the landscape easement that is discussed in that that does not allow trees to be uh, removed or topped unless they're dead or dying. Um, we'd also ask that that easement be extended in any area uh, towards the marsh so that all views from the marsh are protected and will remain protected. I think this is, this is really important because, a, as we know, uh, and there was discussion about this in another application, um, this board, if it approves something, will do so with the best of intentions, but you need to put in the appropriate enforcement of it now. And uh, enforcement of an easement is much easier than going back and saying, well, the planning board thought you were going to do this and you haven't done it and, and um, trying to, to go to a court to get that done. If you have an easement that says it's not going to be cut in those areas, then you have, you have better protections. Uh, the final thing that I wanted to talk about, um, I actually got ahead of myself and talked about the view analysis, which should have been F2D, but I've discussed that. Um, so F2E, uh, while uh, Route Snack Association is opposed to any tower whatsoever on the site, if the board feels that it has to approve one, as has been discussed, we would prefer that it be the stealth tower. We recognize that that means it probably does have to be taller, uh, but as Amy discussed in her presentation, there are ways that the stealth tower can be made to be less visible by the choice of paint that is utilized and, um, and other factors that, that people who are more familiar with poles uh, can discuss with you. Uh, the town planner had suggested the possibility of the monopine, and I think Verizon has said that it's fine with the monopine. We are opposed to the monopine. You saw, uh, if you look at um, sheet Z4 in Verizon submissions, you can see that the monopine actually is, uh, has much more of a, a visual impact than the monopole does with the arrays on the outside. And I think we all agree the monopole with the arrays on the outside in this specific location is very impactful of the view shed. And we would ask that you not allow it to be a monopine. Um, there, I, Ivan tells me that there are good monopines and bad monopines, but the reality is if this thing is going to end up being at least 130 feet, um, it's going to be really visible over the tree line, whether it's good or bad. 
and we would ask that you that you not consider a monopine in this area. The ordinance does authorize this board to require um, a stealth tower with concealed antennas. And again, if you are to grant an approval, we would ask that you do that. Finally, I wanted to just close by saying that while Proud Snack Association has not gotten expert testimony um, concerning the, the impact on, envir uh, on the environment, we would note that you have received communications from Audubon, Friends of Scarborough Marsh, and the Scarborough Land Trust. They all oppose this project, and we oppose it for the same reasons that they do. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Ivan Pogosik with IDK Communications. Great to be back in Scarborough. Um, as it was indicated in 2014, we worked on a wireless assessment uh, for the town. Uh, I've been asked by the, uh, the Proud Snack Association to review the application by Verizon Wireless, and I know you've read my letter. Uh, I, I just wanted to reiterate again a couple points. Um, uh, in, in the due diligence process, uh, I think it would be helpful to explore all options for, uh, for the structure. The applicant has proposed a uh, standard uh, structure, a monopine. Um, I think uh, it would be prudent uh, for the board to ask uh, for the applicant to review uh, a stealth monopole with the antennas internal uh, to the pole. Um, as we indicated, uh, in, in doing so, the pole would have to increase in height because of the mounting antennas, you're, you're compressing them within the pole. Uh, however, uh, I think that if the applicant goes back and, and does their engineering um, and, and can come back with uh, what that minimum uh, height would be uh, to still suffice in offloading uh, uh, their capacity uh, um, from, from the neighboring uh, sites, uh, that would be worthwhile engineering information to have uh, so you can evaluate. Um, in addition to that, we looked at uh, possibly moving uh, the location uh, of, the, uh, of the pole uh, further north uh, to uh, increase the buffering. Uh, and I think you've seen some uh, visual analysis uh, that was done that shows that difference. Uh, and I think uh, uh, it would be prudent again to ask the applicant about possibly moving that uh, uh, structure uh, into that uh, more buffered area. Um, one other uh, thing to note is that while we talk about co-location, it's always a balance. Um, uh, and this, this location is, is no different than other municipalities where you're struggling with visual impacts. Uh, it's not to say that uh, while your bylaw encourages co-location and that uh, then necessitates maybe a taller pole, that the board may want to look at the possibilities of having multiple smaller poles in a specific area uh, that might uh, be more suited uh, for a particular area due to the visual impact. So that's something to consider. Uh, going forward uh, and might be something for this particular area. I'm available. Any questions um, that you may have? Thank you. Thank you. When I called the town and asked them, how do you present visuals? They said you bring your laptop, and that's above my pay grade. So, uh, if you'll indulge me, and pardon me just for a second, I'm going to slide this. Pardon me. Let's set this up. That's a tough act to follow. Uh, my, my name is Marvin Gates. Can you, can you hear this okay? Yes. And, um, I live at 423 Black Point Road. Uh, I've been, was at the prior meeting, was even at the one where this one didn't make the 
the agenda. Um, came in totally blind to all I knew is I didn't want the cell tower there. I loved the marsh. It was as simple as that. Uh, after the last meeting, I educated myself. I just want you to know that uh, I've read all the documents, uh, absolutely everything from the first application to the resubmission package to the resubmission documents. I've read most of them more than once. I've read all the attachments, the RF reports, Ivan's, uh, Keith's, uh, and I just have some, uh, a couple of remarks I want to make. Uh, I suppose the theme of my five minute presentation is, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, is just transparency. There's lots of talk, there are lots of issues, and I want everything to add up. And as I've gone through this, uh, some of the things have been said, uh, I just don't think SMAT passed the smell test. And not to criticize anybody, I think people speak and they speak. Obviously Verizon's doing their thing. I think that's great, but that's not my thing. And uh, it's not a lot of people's thing. So this is what uh, was published. And I'm showing it here not to educate anybody, certainly on the board, and I so much very appreciate what you do. Um, I'm doing it to show you that I get it. We're here to talk about priority of location, visual impact analysis, and buffering tonight. To begin with, as I said about transparency of a sort, at the last meeting, I highlighted after I, if you can believe this, transcribed most of the last meeting uh, from the video, which I enjoyed doing, obviously. But the, uh, at one point, uh, Mr. Fredette said, and I knew nothing about this, that, and I'm quoting here, so when we came in in 2015, and said, gee whiz, um, we'll wait until you update the ordinance. And I thought, oh, well, that makes sense. I mean, they, why would you want to run into some situation where you're going to not come out favorably before the town has decided what they want to do? Well, one of the first documents I found on the town's website was a letter from Beryl Dana uh, dated 2014, and Jay covered a lot of this already in his history of this. But in that document, it said, uh, again, Beryl Dan is writing for Verizon, as you know, we first began working with the town in May 2013 and have participated in more than a dozen meetings with the council, the ordinance, the review committee, and the planning board since then. And of course, that was all done in anticipation of the uh, passing of the transmission tower overlay districts. Uh, obviously, the town came to Verizon and asked them for advice and what they saw that would improve this, and Verizon gave it. <coughs> Pardon me here. In this uh, email that uh, uh, Verizon sent to uh, the person who was then the uh, uh, Jay's predecessor, Dan Bacon. Uh, I w forgive me if I take a little bit of extra time. I apologize. Yeah, I, think I'm I will take the over on the five minutes. I will. So, I will speed right. up. It'll go quickly. Right. Thank you. Uh, I like the fact that Verizon, in their remarks, in this letter, recommended against the 25-acre minimum because, as they said. Strict prohibitions can have the unintended effect of forcing carriers to locate towers in areas with higher actual visual impacts and limiting the authority of the planning board, which, again, everybody knows I'm sort of sharing it here. But the, for, in their wisdom, the town council obviously adopted it, and it is hamstringing where this thing can go dramatically. And uh, 
My question is why did they do that, but that's for another time. Okay, and in this email, uh, Chip responded, uh, uh, this is an email that Dan Bacon sent out to all the carriers and asked, uh, you know, as you're aware, this is a big deal. It affects property value, scenic view. Uh, tell us where you want these things in general, uh, general terms. Chip answered, while I cannot identify Verizon's wireless's candidate properties, I wanted to answer the questions more generally. I circled four of Ivan's suggested areas. Well, Chip said he can't identify them specifically and is very general, except in one category, one place, and that's the one under consideration. So it's been identified for a long time prior to the establishment of the transmission tower overlay district. And uh, again, I mean, I don't have any conclusion to draw. In that email, Chip wrote, I have circled in Ivan's report the four areas that Verizon's interested in. Uh, one is the broad turn road, which was mentioned, and I'll get to that in a second. There are two others, and then, of course, the one down in the sanitary district. This is out of Ivan's assessment of 2014 that he wrote for the town. Uh, You can see that Ivan identified one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight other locations, as was pointed out earlier, and some of this I will say might be repetitive. Here's the transmission, transmission tower overlay districts. Three of Verizon's are here, and the other one is here. Eight or nine of Ivan's locations were not included and do not meet the 25 acre minimum. So they're out of the, you know, this is what you're given. I understand that. You can't do anything about it. But uh, there is, of course, this is what we're talking about. There is this transmission tower overlay district here. Uh, I do have. Uh, the gentleman from Beryl Dana, I, I don't know your name. Pardon. Scott. Scott said earlier, and I'm going to take some exception to it, I'm obviously not an engineer, that uh, the uh, idea of the tower here is for coverage issues. And Chip, in your meeting, uh, the last meeting, on the subject of why the tower is here, said, and I quote, uh, from the beginning here, we are with our existing coverage map. Again, the goal is to provide coverage to Prout's Neck, okay? That can't be done from areas off of Prout's Neck. It's got to be done from Prout's Neck in the area to provide coverage pushing outwards. Well, I've read the RF report, and I'm definitely not an engineer, of course. They count what units Verizon wants from this tower as POPs. And I'm going to speak just grossly, in gross generalities. As I understood the RF report, this tower, and my numbers will be wrong, but the percentages will be close enough, allows Verizon about 5,000 POPs. Whether it's two-thirds of those or three-quarters of those POPs, and I know that they'll agree with this, that is for capacity issues in Old Orchard Beach and Saco. An eighth, or thereabouts, are for coverage area, areas here. The other eighth, or you correct me, are for coverage areas this way. Unless I totally misread it, which I don't think I did, that means that the real lion's share of these pops are for capacity issues. I don't know if you put a tower here whether that tower is too close to the water tower uh, location in Old Orchard Beach to pass off, to make good pass offs or not. That's a technical issue I understand. But I think this area should be considered 
as a place for a tower for capacity reasons, not for coverage reasons. This is about transparency. This isn't a coverage issue. You have the entire community saying they don't want it. I mean, maybe there's some kind of homeland security issue that the government... Uh, we'll, 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 we'll have the opportunity pardon to ask me, the applicant... Pardon me, Thank you very much. I appreciate we've, it. We've reviewed all the information. Thank you. I, I appreciate understand. your efforts. We do need Zoning to wrap it up. Buffering. Yes. This is what it's about. Dense tree growth surrounding the area. Pardon me. This is staff review of the resubmission package, which they're presenting tonight. Their response to buffering was, because the site is so far set back from any road or adjacent property, the buffering that disguises the site is not the tree cover immediately surrounding the site, but instead the tree cover immediately in front of the viewer from that particular vantage point. That's Verizon. And then they say they're happy to do a view shed analysis. These are the images that I took at the crane from the marsh. Staples printer did a terrible job. But this would be greatly advantaged if I knew how to set my laptop up. There's the crane. These are taken from six different locations from around the marsh. Lots of black ink. There's the crane. You can see the white bottom of the crane. This is a building. Here's the crane, purely visible. It's black ink. You can see the buildings again. That is not, in my opinion, dense tree growth. There's the money shot. The crane is completely in sight. Again, you can see the building to the uh, right. This is circling the marsh. This is not one location. And there it is again. I mentioned Broad Turn Road earlier. Chip. I, I, I respectfully, and I, I, I appreciate all your efforts. Oh, no, that's your, all right. But it's getting late, and I think there are other people who also would like to speak, and the board would like to have the opportunity to speak this as well. Broad, so if you could just road please wrap it up soon, I would appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. I really appreciate your indulgence. Broad Turn Road was the, in my opinion, the comparable. And uh, as it was stated in the last meeting, it's really sort of a private junkyard. And there's the monopine that we were asked, we were asked to go view. Uh, and finally, this is staff comment that Horizon's responding to today. Visual impact analysis. They are required to deliver tonight photo simulations at variable heights. This is your own staff, obviously, including monopole and monopine type fixtures. This is necessary prior to the board taking action. And as we all know, they did not deliver at variable heights. And I would very humbly, after thanking you again, request that the board follow staff's recommendation, actually requirement in here, and not take any action tonight before they submit the simulations of the tower at the variable heights. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Vaughn Pratt. I'm another one of those Pratts. I came here in 1942 in a basket, seven months old. I've never missed a year since. My wife and I now are retired. We live in Prout's Neck. And I'm sure there are people that know the marsh better than I do. 
but I doubt there are many because I've traveled all the way up to Black Point Road, all the way to Route 9, many times, now with my grandchildren. And the only thing I would suggest here, without making a plea, is that if you have never seen the view from the marsh looking towards the mainland, from the marsh, I would like to make this offer. Uh, I've scrubbed every pot there is at the Proud State Yacht Club and done everything there is to do there. But I'd like to happily invite those members that I'm looking at right now to come down and go see that marsh by boat, see the viewpoints from the boat, rather than see them from a road or a piece of land. I think you would get the feeling that a lot of people here have presented towards you if you wanted to do that and could do that. So that's an invite from me to you on behalf of the Yacht Club. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Going once, twice. All right, well, thank you very much for, for all the comments and the, the other materials. And it's a lot to consider and a lot to digest, and we, we do appreciate it. Uh, and again, we don't intend to make any action on this tonight. We'll have some discussion and try to land at a point where we're kind of in general agreement on next steps. Susan? I'm sorry, but I have to tell Mr. Pratt, I've been here since 1941. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually older than you. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother was Dora Shaw, Dora Dora Shaw, <clears throat> librarian down there until, you know, 90-something. I live in her house. Mrs. Shaw was a good friend of mine. She was a good friend of everybody in Prousneck. I just want you to know that I know Prousneck as well as you do, and maybe even better, because I, remember I lived there year round back in the day when people didn't like the marsh because it smelled badly and the mosquitoes just drove you inside every, every night. It was awful. People oh, threw their, no, 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 my turn, my turn. <laughs> People threw their trash in there, they threw their tires in there, the marsh meant nothing. It was just a horrible thing. And to take care of it all, they sprayed DDT up and down both sides of Black Point Road every week, all summer long. And we didn't have any mosquitoes, but guess what else we didn't have? We didn't have birds. What those birds were so worried about? We didn't have any birds, because there was nothing for the birds to eat. And then along came Rachel Carson. And slowly but surely, everything changed. Now, I am as dedicated to Prousneck as anybody you're going to find. I back up to the Libby River. Um, Mr. Pratt you knows the work that we went through with the land trust to save the Larrabee Farm. I'm the person who called and said we've got to save the Larrabee Farm. Because from my house, I look right out at it. I worked very hard for over 25 years to have something to do with saving land in Scarborough. This, this makes me want to get right down on my knees and cry. This, you know, this is, this is not something that I personally can take lightly. But we really have to pay attention to what the ordinances say. And all that you've said tonight will be taken into consideration, I guarantee you will be taken into consideration. It'll be looked at through microscopes. But I didn't want you to think that, you know, <laughs> that we didn't have a sense of perspective on all of this. We really do. I think that you know, I've been on the Comprehensive Plan Committee for the previous comp plan and one for our present comp plan we're working on, and view corridors and natural resources are some of the top priorities for what has to happen in Scarborough. So I'm just trying to say you can rest assured that none of this is going to be taken lightly. We're not going to make any decisions here this evening. 
we're going to be very careful and very thorough, and I do appreciate what all of you have had to say tonight. It's been very helpful for me, but I just had to giggle. I mean, seriously. I, I've been here since 1942. Well, I've been here since 1941, and I really don't want to see it change. You're preaching to the choir. Yeah, I know, but so were you. Anyway, thank you for the opportunity to say that, and I do, I do think we should probably not try to do any, any okay. kind of decision making this evening, obviously. Do you have any questions or comments to direct to the applicant? No, I think there's an awful lot to think about right here. I mean, I don't really want to go into asking all those questions of the applicant tonight. I think that we need, I'm not even sure that this is a thought that just popped. I personally feel as if I would like a little bit of a workshop on this. There's an awful lot of conflicting kinds of things going on out there, and I'm not sure I really know how to, how to actually get into all of this. If you want us to do it here behind, you know, behind the um, desk, that's fine. But I don't know. Okay. I'm confused can... enough that I think a little bit of a workshop would be helpful. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Roger? Sure. I, I do have a few questions. Um, I don't understand the rationale why Verizon wants to put a tower here when there seems to be so much opposition and also the, um, the coverage seems to be excellent. Can, can you explain that? Yeah, so two things. The, the way we design the network <clears throat> is the radio frequency engineers look at what the coverage and capacity is for the <coughs> existing towers and then we identify areas that are problematic either because the coverage isn't what it should be or because uh, uh, towers in the vicinity are kind of overloaded from folks that are kind of where a new site might be located so that the, the network is balanced. So there's kind of a balance here of coverage and capacity. I think Ivan made a reference to that, or one of the commenters made a reference to that, and that is very much the case. This is, this is a balance. And so Verizon Wireless does not go and spend time and money and effort to lease up property and construct sites in locations that we don't need. And we are frequently kind of presented with, well, look, my, my phone works okay, but that's not the way, notwithstanding those old Verizon commercials where the guy stepped every three feet and said, can you hear me now? That's actually not how we design the network. There are seasonal fluctuations. There are uh, capacity issues that change during different times of the year. And what we're doing is what most of the carriers are doing, is making sure we have a system that works and is balanced with all the different sites. And um, so we need to be here. That was the, um, the kind of start of this process, Keith's report. Uh, I think it is um, very important um, that you folks have Modern Grid partners to review a lot of the technical aspects here. Um, because this is kind of complicated and um, it's worse than looking at traffic reports. I think in trying to identify um, whether or not there is a need um, and whether or not this site is in the right location and whether or not some of the other uh, areas that we've talked about work, um, I think looking at what Keith has submitted, looking at what MGP has submitted to the board and any follow-up questions with them is important to kind of understand that. But this is very important to the network and we do need the site in this location. Okay, so basically you're saying it's absolutely necessary even though there doesn't seem to be any demand for it. But well, from a technical point of view, you feel it's necessary. Yeah, I mean, and look, we, we listened very carefully tonight and took pages and pages of notes and we're going to try to kind of summarize the, the different issues and get back to you with our thoughts. We appreciate that and on many of these sites there are people that, that don't want it for lots of reasons and we heard a lot of concerns about visual impacts um, and, and so there are, however, and I, you probably see this with every big case that comes before you with this controversy, there are a lot of people sitting at home tonight who don't think that the coverage is adequate and there are a lot of people that visit during the summer that don't think the coverage is adequate and the public safety, the fire and the police submitted uh, information with our initial application saying that their, their radio coverage is inadequate in this area of town as well and they would look forward to being able to put equipment on the tower. So um, we, we respect and appreciate that people have, you know, a lot of the, look, I would love to not have my phone when I play golf because my clients call and it drives me crazy. So um, we appreciate that there are times where people don't want phones, but we're trying to build a system here that will work in all areas of Scarborough um, and that it will work all times of the year, and we think this is important for those goals. 
Um, I just have a few more questions. Is that okay? All right. Of course. Um, the um, the fire station that was brought up. Why, why? I mean, how how closely did you look at replacing that tower to accommodate what your needs are? Well, it's not just the replacement. There's a number of factors, and they kind of start to add up and then bounce that site from the option. First, it's on the, the edge of what we call kind of the coverage uh, gap problems that we have here. So it's not going to cover all areas that the proposed site um, will cover. Second of all, the, 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 the stick site is not structurally capable of handling additional antennas, and replacing the tower theoretically might be possible, but um, it's going to probably be at a higher height, and there's no room on the site to put the equipment um, for our facility. So um, what's clear is that we have to get back to you with more detail on the fire uh, department site, because my sense is members of the community and members of the board have additional questions. So we will kind of muster our resources and get back to you with a little more detail on why that site doesn't work. Yeah, uh, when, I, when I made a note of that, I also wondered, even if you did something with that tower at the fire station, how much opposition there would be to that as well, you know, so you'd, yeah. you'd probably still run into that. I well, think. we do. Usually what we really try to do, and, and I think that the tower height and the visual impacts that we've shown you in The Sims, and even the, about like Terry Dewan's shop and Amy, I've seen her work before. They're very, very good. We've used them on wind power projects. They're very, very good at what they do. Uh, uh, what, what I took away, though, is that we proposed a 100-foot site, and actually we think the visual impacts at this site at 100 feet are very, very good. You start moving the tower around to other locations, the, the topography changes, the height changes, um, and really the key to this site from our perspective is that we're able to do it at 100 feet. Um, and so we, we will provide the board with some more details about the fire uh, department site, but you're right, that nobody is terribly thrilled with a new cell phone tower. What we try to do is develop them in areas where we need them and develop them in ways where the, the visual impacts are minimized to the greatest extent we can. Um, and then uh, the other question that came up was um, the public safety needs. They would want to probably be on this tower as well, mm -hmm. which would probably require it to be higher. Is that correct? No, I, I don't believe so. So what we've, what we've done is we've uh, communicated with the police and the fire that we'll make a space on the tower available. Kind of depends on what their needs are, what kind of equipment. Um, what normally happens is their RF folks work with RF folks to figure out where they need to go. Sometimes they're repeaters, sometimes they're whips. Um, and kind of the distances change based on the equipment and how it might affect. So um, most sites that we do with municipal police and fire do not need to be as high as our antennas. Um, but again, this is, this is kind of something we're offering. It's not a joint proposal to do a, a, a tower for everyone. We're certainly willing to make the space available for free. What we will do before the next meeting is try to have some more detailed conversations with the public safety folks, figure out what they might need and where, so at least you'll, you'll kind of know what that looks like. Okay. And um, then the, the, last, uh, the last point pertained to the uh, stealth poles. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, maybe this is a question for staff also. Um, it seems to me if this stealth pole was put at the same height that you're proposing right now at 100 feet, and then if, there, if somebody else wanted to come in, you know, for coverage, AT&T or whatever, could, could they put, on, put up another stealth pole within the same area, or do they have to have their own setbacks? Do you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I guess I, I'd have to explore the ordinance more closely on that question, but I, I can't think offhand of any prohibition about having multiple um, poles on a, on a single site. Um, and so I think at the outset of this conversation, knowing that really tower height and, and the visual representation or, or what folks are going to see was going to be the critical element, was one of the reasons why I wanted to bring up uh, to the board members the uh, provision, the ordinance around co-location, how it does spell out that if for you know, and it gives sort of rationale for the board to think about maybe you could waive certain co-location standards. Um, it, and so I just wanted to be sure that that was on the board's radar at the outset of this conversation, um, trying to understand what, you know, what, what would and 
recognizing that um, these folks may not know, as they said, you know, what AT&T's needs are or some other uh, carrier, it's just the one I happen to think of, uh, <laughs> need to be at the site at, say, a 77 feet or 88 feet or what that would look like, whether that would service their needs or not, um, you know, would going up and having one tower at 130, say, be less impactful than two towers at 100 feet? I, that, that would really be for the board to, to uh, ultimately come to. Um, and if I could just, and I don't want to step on you, yeah. Roger, but just to build on that, I think one of the comments, one of the recurring themes that I heard from some of the comments this evening was the perception or the, the assumption that co-location Providing for future co-location automatically means the tower has to be higher. And I just, I want to make sure that it's understood that that's, at least as I understand it, hopefully I'm right, um, that that's really at the board's discretion. It's not that the, that the tower automatically becomes 130 feet to allow for co-location. Um, and Verizon, I think, has been pretty clear that what they're specifically requesting is a 100-foot tower. Right. I, I was uh, thinking of that particular site, say AT&T wanted to come in and they wanted to co-locate there, but it would require going up higher. Could they put a south pole rather close to your Verizon pole? You know, is it, In other words, you need to, from a technical point of view, do you have to have a certain distance between your poles? Well, they would certainly need to go to the sanitary district and get a lease because the pole probably couldn't be located within the same fence compound. Um, there might be some siting issues where they, they might have to be a little ways away, but, um, but I think what Jay and the chair are getting at is that if AT&T comes in and says, well, look, we have to go up, um, or we could do the one to the side, you would look at the visual impacts of going up, you would look at the visual impacts of a second pole based on what rights they could get from the sanitary district, and you would make a decision about which one was the best one based on the standards in your ordinance. I think the thing that, that we're trying to be, be very clear about is that um, the only thing that we're looking that, that we need and that is before you now is our one tower at 100 feet. And what we will respond in greater detail. We, we, don't, we don't agree that, that there is anything associated with our project that requires this thing to go up. If the board decides in the future that it would be better to go up as opposed to something else, that would be something that you would review later with a different applicant and a different project. But we, if you granted us an approval, we could go to 100 feet, and we could never go a foot above that. This tower would stay at 100. We would have to come back, go through a whole other process, which we don't ever anticipate doing. So um, yes, a visual impact of a 150-foot pole is worse than a 100-foot pole, especially that difference. 150 to 190, but 100 to 150, that's a big gap. Our pole is not going to be 150 feet, and we'll never be before you looking for that. So um, we'll make sure that we're kind of continue to be clear about that. Okay, okay. would the stealth pole at your height work for you? No, because we have to split. Right now, there are three arrays of antennas, 12 antennas that are going in, in the different directions. When you get rid of the array and you shrink it to the pole, and Keith's going to throw a book at me if I screw this up. But what you have to do is you have to stack the antennas because there's not enough volume inside the pole to put all of the antennas to hit all of the different directions. So that's why Ivan had suggested in his report that if you were going to do the stealth, you get the benefit of no array, but the tower will likely be higher. And, and we're going to have Keith comment on what we think that height would need to be, whether it's 10 feet or higher. Um, and so this is a balance. So if you are you know, in a situation where the, the visual impacts you know, another 10 feet doesn't matter, well, then you might decide to do away with the array. I, I think in this case, and ultimately it's for the board to decide, we're so close to the tree canopy and almost all of the visual impacts, even the ones done by Terry Dewan and Amy, um, you know, the one from the point looking back, when those plop up on the screen at 150 feet, I get it. You go, oh. okay, but at 100 feet, if you did Amy's and you did them as a monopine, I think you're going to see that the visual impacts are very, very minor, and that if you come to those sites after it's in, you look down at the tree line, and you might not even see it. So we'll, we'll talk about more of that in the next round.
Thank you. I'm exhausted. <laughs> we can do this all night. Just kidding. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to keep it brief. Uh, Roger did cover a lot of the questions I had, and it sounds like we're going to see a lot more information. But, you know, I think I reiterated it last meeting was that um, <coughs> U.S. Cellular Tower at the, the fire department. And, and I really think if you can dig into that some more, um, that would really help me overcome the location aspect of what we're looking at here. Um, and I believe MGP, I have their memo right here, and it, it also said that they didn't, didn't think that they had any information regarding that location for them to review. So, so is this the one that was before you with the first agenda item? This is the one dated May 30th, 2018, and the comment was, um, we, however, do not see any information that the Black Point Fire Station or church steeple at 167 Black Point Road have been considered and if deemed insufficient for what reasons. So we'll give more information about the Black Point Fire Station. I, I think that's clear. As Chip had mentioned, the church steeple site, we're already in that right. one. So, yeah, But the fire station is... The uh, fire station. We're, and we'll get... Our last <coughs> meeting, I, I was really still, you know, I was really apprehensive about writing that one off. And I know it, you guys are, so you're blue in the face, we keep telling you you can't put your equipment on the ground. I'm not buying it. There's got to okay. be a way. I mean, there's land. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's, that's what I'm really having trouble overcoming. Um, so, any more data you can give okay. uh, me on that, and then, you know, I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I, I will say this: I, I'm really happy to see people engaging um, in these topics more frequently. I think this is a positive thing, um, and I also hope a lot of you can understand our position here on the board, which is we get handed ordinances and zonings and things that are decided at a council level, at a, at a vote sometimes, and we end up in a really tough spot. You either ask us to not do what we've been appointed to do here, in some cases, by not following what has been laid out for us, and the opportunity for the public to engage and change what it is our mission becomes happens well before we see stuff like this. So. This engagement, I hope, continues, and I hope it's with an eye towards the future rather than trying to prevent something, because if you're not sitting here, I don't think you pay as close attention as you, you, you might want to. And from where I sit, what I see is um, an urbanization of parts of Scarborough, and traffic congestion, use of our technology is going to continue to grow. Um, it's written into our comprehensive plan. We give density bonuses. We have areas of development. And if you're not watching these things closely, this is this is sometimes what might sneak up on you. And we do have a jewel there in the marsh, and I want to make sure that um, we we do a better job of keeping an eye on the future for this stuff. So that's the more you know. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Robin. Yeah, um, I, I really echo what my fellow board members have said and so my first question I feel like I have one primary question and then I have a bunch of secondary questions so my first primary question is is really for us internally is to understand the nexus for what constitutes substantial evidence and justification that the location of higher priority cannot reasonably accommodate the applicants proposed facility and so I really want some legal analysis on this. And I, 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 uh, it, I think it's gonna keep us out of hot water, both now and further on, and I really appreciate Ms. Burns um, from the Prout's Neck Association sort of giving us her analysis. That was actually very helpful, and um, I, I, so I'm, I'm moving into my secondary questions, I guess. My primary question is, we need the legal nexus to understand what that is to make sure that that burden has been met. Um, because as Nick said, you know, we're here to, to, you know, what we have in front of us are the ordinances. And trust me, as Ms. Burns was up, I was flipping right to the pages. And th those of you who know me both in my day job and here, it's, I go by the ordinance, okay? And um, I, I would encourage us to also look at the maximum height of 150 feet with respect to the site geometry, the setbacks, and ask for, for the maximum buffer requirements. I think you know that's 
that's the least we can do here. I also, um, I guess, um, which, which Black Point Church are you talking about? Are you talking about the one that's on the corner of Fog Road, across from Fog Road? Mm -hmm. Is that, t okay, that's the one we're talking about. The Congregational Church. Okay, and so that's within that, that area. And well, no, it's outside the coverage area, as MGP noted. Okay. Chip was just clarifying that to, to meet another coverage area, we went into that steeple and we're current, currently there. So operating. you're already there. We're already in there. So you can't sure. do anything to augment no. that technology there? No, because at that elevation, it does cover the, the gap that we had and the problems we had in that area. But where we are now is farther to the south. And so what about the, the idea or the feasibility of having multiple shorter poles like was brought up here is that does that get you anywhere as far as having three 75 foot <laughs> towers would that give you the same capacity and coverage as 150 foot tower we yeah I mean we will uh, I mean part of the problem is the tree line you, you can't put these towers completely below the tree line mm -hmm. because they can't get through so there is some bit of the line of sight design um, you know, theoretically, can you do multiple sites? Um, it depends on what the elevation. No, nope, I'm talking about one site with multiple towers. Uh, well, no, because remember the the location, both where our site ring is, where the overlay zone has been drafted, and then even the identification of this site happened because you need to be kind of physically in this area of the town mm -hmm. to cover this area. So, multiple towers. Right at another location outside of this kind of search ring can't reach in um, to, to meet the coverage objectives of this site. And I apologize if you've already um, addressed this no, with okay. one of my other colleagues, but there's also that sort of that area, you know, there's like four different areas. There's Broad Turn, there's Pine Point, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry, there's, there's Black Point, and then there's that area down off uh, East Grand Avenue Mm -hmm. down there in near the old orchard beach line mm -hmm. would that be a good site well again I, I just would do, and we'll come back to maybe the alternative piece when we submit additional comments but in the original application we provided keith's report that identified where the existing sites are that we mm -hmm. have where the kind of coverage gap is and also the capacity be okay be, and, so, and that's my other comment to you all is you got to be really careful and stop calling it just a coverage issue I think coverage and capacity, we, we've, we've heard here tonight that it's two separate things. And, and the site is necessary for both. I think what is very helpful is that you folks have retained Modern Grid Partners to mm -hmm. review the technical. Yep. And so um, I want to make sure that both we're responding to your questions, but also that they are responding to your questions because Look, those are that's your expert, and no, and, um, and I guess I, I want to make sure that the point that my point is clear mm -hmm. that I think a lot of I heard over and over again from the community tonight mm -hmm. that people are under the impression that it is a coverage issue, and we kept hearing over and over, I get four bars, I'm fine here, I'm there. It's capacity, well, which it's, is it's, excuse me for yes, just a minute, yeah. but that's old Orchard Beach's problem. Is that our problem? I mean, because if we're using, okay. yeah, I mean, so so we don't agree that the coverage is okay. This is for both coverage and capacity, mm -hmm. um, and and the the what is happening right now is Scarborough has coverage based on facilities that are in Scarborough and facilities that are outside of Scarborough. Understood. And so as we build a network and identify the the coverage gaps we find locations where we need to locate a site and they don't necessarily work if we're coming from another site. And I guess the short answer to your question is that the, the development of the network and our obligations under our FCC license are, are don't stop at town boundaries. And so mm -hmm. there are times in which Scarborough is getting service from a tower mm -hmm. in another town and there are times in which another town is getting service from a tower in Scarborough, and that's kind of the balance. And exactly, and, and I about. think we need to look very carefully at mm -hmm. that balance because there are going to be other places that we might be able to increase capacity without having the same effect on this treasure that we have here in Scarborough. And if it means at the cost of, 
you know, having sketchy cell phone service when you go to Prout's Net Country Club, I think we got, we got, I think we're going to be okay with that kind of a thing. So I just want to be, I, I'm, I just want to ask you to get out ahead of it and be very careful when you're talking about coverage versus capacity. Mm -hmm. All right, we we'll hear you. Okay. <coughs> and then, um, so I feel like we also need to get to the, where you're talking about FCC and you have to share your co-locations with different carriers. So name the big ones for me, AT&T, T-Mobile, US Cellular, because I know a lot of them have merged, right? Who am I missing? Who are the big Other than those in three? our neighborhood? Sprint. Sprint. Is in Sprint and T-Mobile the same? Not yet. OK, so we got four. My point, my point being that we've scoured all of those locations in the, in the area where you could co-locate with others the fire department being one of them, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Okay. Are there any others in that no. cone of influence? There so aren't. Speak? Okay. And, and, that, and that's really the first thing you have to conclude is that we don't have another Sprint, AT&T, or other tower where we could locate our antennas. And I believe MGP has already concluded no, so no such towers is, exist. So my question is, how come those others haven't come before us? Are, are they waiting for you to be the icebreaker? No. I mean, you would have to ask them because... The carriers don't share information about their priorities, and basically, okay. in any region, there are areas where different carriers are focusing on different spots. So, this may be an area where there's already adequate coverage by one of them. Um, it may be one where they're going to come later. It may be one where you don't see them for a very long okay. time. We just won't know. And so, my question would be: if it's adequate coverage, and you know, it's really just a capacity <laughs> issue, then why aren't we just you know sort of sharing kind of a thing? But yeah. I know that you'll all, you'll, yeah. you'll all address it kind of a thing. My, my apologies for the rhetorical no, okay. question. Um, so next, I'd like to get to, and again, just remember, these questions are all secondary to the primary, which is we need the legal nexus to understand whether or not we have substan substantial evidence and justification here tonight. I'm not even going to pretend to be a legal person to, to understand that. I'm asking for help in that realm. Okay, but another secondary question I have is regarding um, uh, the uh, sort of the, um, I think they're mostly avian studies that you sort of gave us, you know, in the, from EBI. Is it EBI, EBI. or ECI? EBI. Um, so which one of those folks came to Scarborough? Uh, EBI has been to the site. Which person? There was a Miss Cohen and then I there's a Mr. Was, Stair. Um, Glenn... I'm not sure who the individual from the company came, but we can figure out who, okay. who that was. Because well, we, I... I the, 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 the report was authored by either the people that came out or based on information collected by the people that came out. What I want to know is, was it a desktop study, or did somebody actually come out and look at the, the, the site and the marsh? And mm -hmm. you can get back to us on yeah. that. Because I'd like to know who that person was, because the person's name that I kept seeing come up in those environmental studies... His address is in Arizona, mm -hmm. and the the fowl and the the fauna and so forth are very different from Arizona to Maine. That is correct. Okay, so have you had any discussions with IF and W US uh, Fish and Wildlife Service? Anyone yet? The, so there's a consultation process that goes through the NEPA with regard to the FCC license. And I understand and, you're not and, there yet. And we can we, we can figure out where they are in that process. Well, I just, I know that you have a sort of a critical path with how you get things done generally in a site, but this is not your typical site, as you can see from all the folks who mm -hmm. came out here tonight. So I would, I would implore you to sort of start these conversations early, as well as with the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. Um, I'm not sure if you're, I mean, I know that, you know, in order for the Scarborough Sanitary District to be there, they'd had, they'd had to go through the Maine Historic Preservation mm -hmm. Commission, but you're going on brand new land there, which may be, um, may have some Native American influence um, in all down the neck. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with why they mm -hmm. call it Massacre Pond or not kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So you're going to, you know, I would, I would really encourage you to find out as much information as possible about this, this land area because it is a, a, a Native American archaeological site. And just because the Scarborough Sanitation District is built there doesn't mean that that sort of that other area that I think uh, Amy Siegel was talking about that's a little bit northeast in the same property kind of a thing, 
that could still have some archaeological implications that you may and want that, to be aware of. Those conversations may have started. We'll get Good. you the Excellent. status of, of where those are. Glad to hear it. Um, so I think, um, I think that EBI reports are a drop in the bucket uh, to compare to what we need to look at ecologically as far as understanding the value of the marsh, <laughs> not only the mortality of, of the avian species, but also terrestrial populations haven't been analyzed, you know, amphibious, that type of thing. And uh, I'm talking from a, you know, who knows if it's, you know, what type of, uh, you know, and in fact, I think, Chip, when you were here last, I was asking you, what other type of ecological studies do you generally do in sensitive estuarian sort of areas? So I'd be, I'd be looking for similar, because I feel like that what we have so far is just very baseline sort of, um, uh, it's a good start. So thank you very much. But I, I agree with um, Lucy LaCase that an environmental impact, you know, statement is definitely coming, which sounds like it will with, with your NEPA process. No? You want to? Yeah, so, so normally we end up doing an EA, an environmental assessment. Uh, environmental impact statements are not normally required because the impact of sites like this is relatively minor. Um, and it, it may be good, I mean, I think going to your big point of kind of the standard and, and mm -hmm. meeting our burden, you know, the, the environmental information that we provide is based on the site where we're locating and an evaluation mm -hmm. of whether the site, there are certainly, we appreciate visual impacts on the marsh. Um, we need to be clear with you about whether we think there are any physical impacts to the marsh, which would obviously trigger habitat and things. So, yeah. um, you and know, quite frankly, we want to make sure. We've already heard you, that you don't think that there's a, a quite a large enough. So I'm not sure that EA is enough. So maybe EIS would be, would be more. And maybe that's another question maybe for, for legal yeah. analysis, whether or not it's, okay. it's needed kind of a thing. Because it's late, and um, I, I just I just want to make sure that I like I, I've wrote, written down so many things. I just I want to make sure that I've purged it all, so I don't come back and ask you again. And, <laughs> we appreciate and, that. And 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 uh, you know, for for me, I'd rather come up here and hear everything than have it get <laughs> strung along here, there, and everywhere. Um, but I would um, I would just like to end, I guess, by saying that I we really appreciate all the work that you're doing to look at alternative technology, alternative sites, and please be patient with us as we do work through this to understand what our legal nexus is and, and what the approach can be kind of a thing. So just just bear with us and we will keep doing what you're doing. Great. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Rachel? Uh, it's a tough act to follow. Um, I've done an awful lot of uh, negotiations for union contracts and one approach that I've used is called interest-based bargaining, where the, um, where the people have an opportunity to explore interests rather than positions. Uh, and I would like to go along with what I think uh, our colleague, Ms. Auglis, uh, talked about in terms of a workshop, because that's an opportunity to explore rather than sitting, me sitting here or us sitting here and you in back of uh, a different podium. Uh, it's an opportunity to have more of a conversation. Um, at the basis of good interest-based bargaining is good data. And we are starting to get some good data, but I think there is even more that, that we need. And I would go back to the prior meeting that we had and some of the very first questions that we had, which were roughly along the line of, could you define what you mean by um, problems with capacity? Uh, as we talk about the lack of capacity, uh, it reminds me of the conversations that we have around parking. How much parking do you need for a big box store, and the answer is usually you need enough parking to handle the Christmas rush. And the rest of the years, you don't, you don't need that much. Are we talking in terms of capacity about what we need when the day trippers come down to the beaches? Is that really the, the issue behind capacity? Or are we running into capacity problems because of the increased growth of year-round residents? I think 
that's something that we need to know. If we're talking about short-term capacity issues uh, on Saturdays and Sundays in the summer, then maybe what we're looking at is a different way of providing service for those folks. And that might be around something called, the uh, one of the folks mentioned a distributed system instead, instead of a tower. I just don't know. I, I'm, I think we need to really explore what you mean by the need for increased capacity so that we can understand really where, where you're coming from and it will allow us through a workshop uh, to, for you to explore where we're coming from. I, you've heard the, the talk about the marsh and how important it is, not just uh, today, but it's been important for years and years. And it is in our culture. It is automatic to protect the marsh in Scarborough. It is so integral to our life here. And our plan, our comprehensive plan that's, that's coming up, that's being developed, is only going to reinforce that. I think as our need for technology increases and our use of technology increases, we are going to need to explore better fashion, better ways to provide that sort of technology access that our people need. And we have a chance with your request and your proposal, we have a chance to really go back and start that exploration and take a hard look at what we need and where we might need it. So I'd like to uh, reinforce the request for a workshop to really explore some of the, the data that's out there, whether it's on the wildlife, uh, on the capacity issues, I know that at the prior meeting I had requested for an analysis or an exploration of the impact of that site on potential Native American uh, archaeological finds. Uh, I was kind of disappointed we didn't see that this time. Uh, I think we need to just play and continue that uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Brent? Um. Last. Um, so I read through all the emails and listened to all the public comment. And generally, my belief is if someone buys a piece of property in Scarborough and they follow the rules, then they should be able to build what their neighbor builds. In this case, um, this board is the planning board for the town of Scarborough, so I won't go on too long here. But I think that we're supposed to represent the people of Scarborough. And I know that Verizon wouldn't be spending the money and the time if they didn't feel that they really needed this tower for capacity or for coverage or whatever you want to call it. But I think there's got to be some kind of compromise or it's just never going to work and you're all going to be wasting your time and we're going to be wasting our time, honestly. We could do a workshop, we could look for arrowheads, we could find rabbits. There's a million different reasons, right? Everybody's got a reason we don't want this tower. And I'm not saying I want it or I don't want it. I'm just saying I heard a lot of people tonight that, that feel strongly about it. So, but I don't want to see Verizon invest this kind of money and not be able to come to get something that they need. So I think you, we got to look at it. Um, you know, you got to, if you look at the, the fire station, what if you go with the taller tower there, right? Maybe you can, maybe, maybe people wouldn't mind if you put a taller, stronger tower there. Now you got your equipment problem, right? You got to put your equipment somewhere. I heard that earlier. Put a vault in the ground. Power companies do it all the time. We got complete control rooms underground. There's 70 foot poles out there in front of people's houses. As long as you don't put it right in front of the house, they don't say anything about it. There's a 65 foot pole right in front of the Grange, which is right across the street from my house. And it doesn't really bother me. What if you make the pole look like a telephone pole? Then would it be better? I don't know. You'd have to ask these people. 
they might say, yeah, you know what? I got a telephone pole right in front of my house. I don't even notice it, and I want that electricity. Well, I mean, this is vacation land. We want the tourists, right? People are going to come here. They're going to want to work. They're going to want to be able to get their emails on their phone. They don't get their emails on the phone. Maybe they don't come back. Maybe Joe's fruit stand shuts down. This tower sounds like something that the community might need or does need, and maybe we don't even realize it. But we can't, you know, there's too many people here tonight. And there's a lot of people at home that want this tower that, you know, the people that want it don't want to show up because they don't want to see the mob out front. Um, there's got to be something we can do. I mean, what happens if you make the tower shorter? Does the coverage go down exponentially? Probably not good. I would say look at that fire station. Put a bigger tower, put it higher, put it stronger, put your vault underground. If it can't be done there, you know, it might have to look somewhere else. But, man, a 100-foot tower there, I just hate to see everybody waste their time. And, and your time is valuable. I know you getting us all the reports and, and you know they're all very professionally done they look good I can't find a flaw in them but at the end of the day we're gonna vote it's gonna be tough for the people over here to vote against the people over there it's, it is I'm just telling you the way it is the way I see it so and I could be wrong but I mean are we gonna do a workshop and 15 more meetings and then figure out them right or are we gonna try to figure something out here that's, that's just the way I see it. I don't have a lot of questions for you. I know a taller tower would be better. Let's see if we can put it somewhere else. And I know nobody else is going to want it in their backyard either. I mean, you put it over by my house. I won't mind because I like towers. But <laughs> other, most people aren't going to want it, you know. Um, so there's that overlay zone, and, and we can look at five different sites. And I know the fire station's right on the edge. Maybe that's the best we can do is settle for the edge and do the best you can. Because, like I said, I just don't see it happening. I'm not telling you I'm going to vote for it or against it. It's going to be tough to vote for it. So there's got to be something else we can come up with. Get a composite pole. We bought an 85-foot composite pole just a few weeks ago. We stuck it in the ground. People drive by it every day. They think it's wood. Nobody complains. People don't notice wood near as much. Now you got that array on there too, right? So, I mean, that's all I get to say. I'm just going to be saying the same thing over and over again. You get people over here, you get people over there, and there's a lot of people over there. I know you're following the rules, and normally, if you follow the rules in Scarborough and you buy a piece of land, I think you should be able to do with it what the rules say you can do with it. it doesn't you, your neighbor could have done the same thing? But those are people that are coming into this community and they want to be in this community. Um, it, it, it's not the same here, really. Um, you know, you don't own the property yet. I know you put a ton, lot of time and money into it. And I want to see you successful. And I don't want to see you waste your time. And I don't want to waste mine. So that's all I got. Thank you. Um, so. Before I say my little piece here, just a quick programming note. We're obviously past 1030, so we're not going to get to any other agenda items. So if anyone is holding out for Rosewood Land Development or Sun and Shine Realty, you'll have to wait for another time. Um, so we do apologize for that, but there are times that that happens. Um, so, you know, to sort of pick up a little bit on what Rick was saying, and, and I'll still dove, dovetails with what Nick said earlier, I mean, uh, we're sometimes put in a tough position on this board, particularly when um, we're trying to interpret and enforce an ordinance that has some novel characteristics to it. Um, you know, that, that hasn't. You know, we, we don't have a lot of case history, so to speak, on, on the, with this particular ordinance. Um, so, you know, I. I and again, I know we all appreciate all the public comment, and when you know there was a someone made the comment at one point, well, I started, I started off with the position that I don't want this, and then I did a bunch of research. And I, I totally appreciate that, and I totally respect that, but as board members, we can't start with a conclusion. Mm -hmm. 
we have to look at the information, look at the data, listen to our experts, listen to the public, um, and make the best determination that we can. So I hope everyone appreciates that. Um, I've only lived in Scarborough since 2004. I'll just put that out there. So. <laughs> I will concede that right away. But like, like many of you and many people in Scarborough, I chose to come here um, because I value so many, so many of the things about this area. And I chose to become involved with the town to help shape and preserve those resources in that future. Um, and I certainly value this marsh and everything around it um, as much as anyone here. Um, so I certainly can't compete on tenure, so I just wanted to get that out there. Um, but, but to get back to sort of the, the process here and, and, and where we are, um, and I hear what Rick is saying about you know seemingly endless meetings and so forth, I do think there is something to the notion of, of having, or at least considering, and it's something we can talk about with staff offline the staff can coordinate with the applicant as appropriate as to have some sort of a workshop. We've done that in other cases where we've had big proposals that have a lot of unique characteristics on which we can easily spend hours and hours of time as we have tonight. Crossroads, uh, the Downs property being one of them, we've had a couple of workshops outside of our normal planning board schedule. So we can look at that. Um, I think there were a lot of good good comments and requests and it sounds like the applicant and I know that staff has taken a lot of notes on uh, homework so to speak things that we want to see we certainly want to see more detail on the um, alternate sites including the, the, the Black Point fire station um, more detail on the nature and, and positioning of the, of, of, of the fire department equipment if that's to be co-located mm -hmm. um, I think it would be helpful to understand uh, the feasibility of or how does co-location work if you do a stealth tower um, and again I, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to answer that right now um, in terms of the and I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit but uh, you know certainly a big emerging theme is this whole coverage versus capacity and that gets to just sort of providing us with some more um, context on the technical parameters and as Rick alluded to I don't think Verizon is doing this for fun because they like to be here on Monday nights really late. Um, you know, not like the rest of us here who, who actually do volunteer for this. Um, so I'm sure that there's a compelling reason why Verizon is pursuing this and going through this process and that their, their, their data behind that. We just, as lay people, need to sort of understand what, you know, what that all looks like and what it means. Um, Robin, uh, raised the, the question about sort of, you know, having the understanding what the legal nexus is and having just been recently at a Long Ridge Planning Committee meeting where we were talking, we were reviewing uh, proposed revisions to not, not this ordinance, but to another ordinance in town. And we got to just really micro wordsmithing and words like substantial mm -hmm. um, are really tough because they make it, you know, in some ways they give some discretion, but it also leaves room for interpretation and so um, you know I, I don't know that we're going to get a bright line magic bullet that tells us okay now we know that they've met these requirements at some level the way the ordinance is right now and that's what we have to work with there's going to have to be a judgment and that's part of what we're not paid to do but that's part of what we're <laughs> part of what we're appointed to do uh, is to is to make some judgments in certain cases so we can certainly ask through staff for some guidance to the extent that it's available that, that the town can provide um, in a legal sense as to sort of, you know, what we should look for as a threshold, but I don't know that we're going to get something that's, you know, check the box, um, black or white. So um, with that, I won't belabor all the other, you know, requests for discrete pieces of information. I think you have all that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just thank everyone again and um, appreciate everyone's patience and, and the time and energy. And so what we will do is we will pull together um, responses to what we've heard tonight and 
I think what I'm inclined to do is both address some of the factual questions and also to the extent I can address some of the legal questions about what we think, you know, what we're trying to show and why we think we might meet the standards and get that to you. And then we appreciate that you will make a decision about your process going forward about how to review that and go the next steps. And we can kind of work with Jay and the staff offline as well to figure out what the next steps are. But the first thing I want to do is get information to you responsive to what we've heard tonight. And then to the extent I think we've already given it to you, I will respectfully say I think we already gave it to you, or we'll say, I don't think we have anything more, that's it, take a crack at it, and we'll try to give you kind of our best complete shot of everything, and then you folks can figure out what the best next step is. Mm -hmm. All right? Great. Thanks. I would so just like to say thank you for that, because this has been a, a difficult environment for me. I don't understand technology mm -hmm. well, and this has got such a large impact. Um, and everybody who came tonight, you know, I mean, the fact that you showed up, the interest that you have feeds our, I'll, I'll own it, feeds my desire to know more. So thank you for your interest and stay tuned. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you. All right. Staff report? I don't be. believe we have any <laughs> report this evening. We're still we're still wrapping up our meeting. It's a fantastic yeah, we still have more we legal. Have we have more business. More, more business, business to, to finish. Oh, um, you can uh, follow up with Jay later, and he'll. Yeah. So so any any applicant who was not able to be heard this evening because of time, staff will follow up with you and. Our next and board meeting is in three weeks. Right. So June, Our next board meeting is in three June weeks. June 25th is the next meeting. Yep. Yes. Right. Correct. Right. Thank you. And folks, we are we we do have a little bit more board little bit more board bus, board business to take <laughs> care of. I'm all out of words here. Um, so we so just ask shush. you to sort of move on out into the lobby and. And we'll finish up. Thank you very much. Let's say that three times fast. More board business. More board business. All right. So, uh, Jay, is there a staff report? I don't believe we have anything to report this evening. We'll, we'll save you the two or three <laughs> small items I had. All right. Thank you. Administrative amendments. That's another good one. There was a an administrative amendment <laughs> recently. Uh, the Nenseth River Brewery received administrative approval uh, for revisions to their dumpster enclosure. Who did? I'm sorry. Nenseth River Brewery. Okay, thank you. Yep. Based on the fact that it was all, it's already well screened. Yeah. Uh, any planning board correspondence beyond the correspondence we've? 113 letters. Right. <laughs> 128. Mm. All right. Thank you. Uh, any general planning board comments? I got a few. I, I would just like to say I'd like to thank staff for putting into the comments specifically where the ordinances are that we should go to. That was extremely helpful, actually, on the on the the um, the cell tower one. So keep doing that. I really like to you know yeah, I, reference citations. Ab absolutely, I agree. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice job, staff. Mm -hmm. That's how you train us. If we, if we do have a workshop, I think we should take up Mr. Pride's invitation. Oh. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm in. Mean. Uh, have a picnic? All right. All right. Um, I move to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor. Thank you. It's the one thing we got to vote on. <laughs>